Oh, hey, everybody, we're live. Let me get caught up on some comments here. We'll see who we've got watching. Harley, Mel, you made it in early tonight. Nice. Tanked up. How are you this evening? Gabriel, Beth, welcome home. I hope you're feeling better. All right, we are on all messages, so hopefully we haven't missed anybody. Doesn't appear so. Joseph, how are you this evening? Laura. Ark Knight, I'm going to hit the hell out of them fish. Eyeball. Fish hippie, you made it. All right, we don't really have anything to do, so to speak. I did a little bit of work in here already today. Um, we could probably do a little work in the Garami tank. It needs to be topped off and therefore doesn't hurt to do a water change, wipe the glass down, that sort of thing. Don't know if we're going to do that or not. We may, uh, and we can get in and do some filter maintenance on the ham tank because that tank constantly needs attention. They are a very heavy bio load in that. 40 breeder. Carson, how are you? Another ninja, Peter, Shirley. Rawr. Uh, so we can get in and do that. Uh, and of course we have to feed everybody, but it looks like according to my poll, we don't have a lot of participants yet, but according to the participants we do have, oh wow, we got how many now? 17 votes, and they are all for yes. So, all right, that is a uh, resounding yes for talking about the nitrate tonight. Deborah, Robert, welcome aboard. All right, so we will talk about uh, the nitrate tonight, and I will go into extensive discussion about everything I can think of to talk about with nitrate. Uh, I'm going to base a lot of this on the fact that I just watched a video from uh, Alex the other day, the Secret History Living in Our Aquariums channel, and I don't like using the word misleading because that makes it sound like he was deliberately giving out wrong information or deceitful information of some sort, and I don't believe that to be true, but... It was when you came away with it, if you were going into it, not knowing anything, and that's what you were relying on for your source of information, you would have come away with it with some information that's misleading. It's not wrong, but there's a great big asterisk attached to it that he doesn't mention in the video. And it left me so puzzled that I had to comment and ask him, like, what do you mean? And he clarified, and I was like, all right, that's what I thought you were talking about. But he doesn't say that in the video. And he also talks in the video about it being this new study that was done. And I take issue with the idea that there was a new study that was done uh, on nitrate. It's That's, again, not entirely accurate. And so that's mainly what I want to address. And again, in the process of that, I'm going to talk about everything I can possibly think of to talk about uh, nitrate. And hopefully you'll come away with a much better understanding of what it's doing in your aquarium and how it's impacting or rather not impacting uh, life in your tank. It does have its impacts, but it's probably not what you think they are. So we'll talk about all that um, as the evening progresses, but we'll have to get everybody fed and then I'll cop a squat and hunker down. And once I'm sitting down, we'll talk all about the nitrate tonight. Oh, let me see. Christopher, hello. Amy, hello. Steve, starting your drive from Pennsylvania. Mama's in the Bible's. No, actually tonight uh, with the music, we can probably wrap that one up pretty briefly. We don't even have to play the game necessarily. I was in another mood tonight, and so I thought, man, you know, ballet worked for me on Friday. Let's give that a shot again. And so as I sort of made clear on Friday but never really bothered going into it, it's like I'm not really a ballet guy. Um, and when I was asked if that was my favorite ballet, I, you know, like I 
I don't know. I don't. I, I couldn't name two ballets. I can name Swan Lake that I was watching, and I could name Nutcracker. Uh, those are the only two ballets that I actually could name. So tonight I thought about it, and I so I looked up. Um, you know, what are some the most popular ballets out there? And I recognized a couple once, like Sleeping Beauty. Like, okay, now that you say that, okay, I remember that's a ballet or whatever. But the one that caught my attention was Midsummer Night's Dream. I always think of that as a play. Uh, rather than a ballet. And so I said, hey, we'll give that one a shot, you know? So I was doing stuff around the basement and kind of listening to it more than watching it. And Swan Lake is just sort of like standalone classical music. If you're not watching the ballet, you can still listen to it and enjoy it. You can still hear the story unfolding and it's, it makes sense musically. Midsummer Night Dream, like it just sounded like the music was accompaniment to the action that was happening on stage. And if you weren't watching the action, the music made no sense. It wasn't music necessarily. And so I wasn't particularly enjoying it. And it sounded wrong. It sounded like a high school production or something. The audience kept clapping like every time a performer would do something that might be considered challenging to an amateur uh, dancer or something like the audience would cheer like a bunch of proud parents, you know, whose whose kids just got through the tough spot in the, in the recital. Um, the, the audience sounded really small. It sounded really close. And I was like, what the fuck am I listening to? And so I went in and I looked and one of the dancers as they, you know, flitted across the stage was not actually on their toes. They were like tippy toeing the way I would tippy toe on like a cold floor or something. I was just like, Oh, what the fuck am I watching? Uh, and it turned out it was the international ballet school production and it had like 47 subscribers to the YouTube channel or something. Um, so it was amateurs. And it, I mean, it wasn't terrible. It was a hell of a lot better than I'd ever be able to do, but it was definitely not cutting the mustard for me uh, and my musical tastes tonight. So I finished up. I just, finishing up with Swan Lake. And I actually just was able to finish the uh, ballet about two minutes before we went live. So that's my musical story for tonight. Uh, don't listen to a amateur theater production of Midsummer Night Dream. And uh, Swan Lake is excellent to listen to, even if you're not watching it. So there you go, everybody. Thank you, Laura. But I did start out with some Boris Brecha earlier when I was on the Bowflex. Window Liquor, how are you? New Gambusia species. I knew there was an East Coast and a West Coast species, as is right and proper. We should always divide the East Coast and the West Coast, knowing, of course, that the East Coast is better. Uh, but I didn't know there's other species of Gambusia in there. I know you said you had the melanistic kind, if I'm not mistaken. All right, Zine, how are you? The Nutcracker is good, but the Nutcracker is so Christmassy that I just, I don't know, I can't, if it, any earlier than October and I can't listen to Nutcracker, it just seems wrong. <laughs> I don't know if that makes any sense or not. TK, how are you doing? Vinegar eels, that sounds interesting. Hey, gamer. Are they actual eels or are they just some kind of worm? All right, Christopher. Well, I hope you feel better. I don't know if there's anything I can do to cheer you up. Sally Ann, how are you doing? Uh, all right, let's go over and get, well, you know what? Let's feed the, the pond first and then we can turn that light out. That's usually the routine. The pond light tends to put a lot of glare on the rest of the tank. Oh, we got somebody that said no on the uh, don't want to hear about nitrates tonight. Well, too bad, because we're going to talk about them. Although you have a good bit of time before we actually sit down and get to talking about them. Thank you, Laura. 20 rosy minnows. Nice. All right. We are going to throw goldfish pellets in there once again, only because I have so damn many of these. I need to just keep getting rid of them. I actually shot some uh, tank cam video feeding the pond yesterday, 
And when I reviewed it to see if I got any good footage, it was so noisy that I had to come down here and I stuck my ear against the side of the pond and I could actually hear the noise coming off the pump. Uh, and so I got in there and, and cleaned out the uh, intake on the, uh, the pump a little bit. And I changed out the filter on the, um, well, I changed out the pad in the filter, I should say. Oh, we got another person that says they don't want to talk about nitrate. Well, too bad to you, too. I'm still going to talk about it. Uh, not a huge selection on the weeds tonight. I did pack up a bowl. Um, uh, that's that homegrown stuff my neighbor gave me, and then I soaked it with some of my Wicked Space goo. And, of course, we have some of the Wicked Space goo that we'll be hitting on later. This is some pretty damn good stuff, too. And that is 100% made. Uh, if you saw that stuff I had hanging the other night, this was the sugar leaf that I trimmed off of what I had hanging, and I made that with it, and it is friggin' delicious. It is so good. So I got the stuff that was hanging is now in a jar, and it's finishing up the last little bit of drying for the next couple of days, and then hopefully it'll have time to start curing a little bit before I start, um, you know, working with it. But tonight, we're going to be hitting on just some regular old stuff made out of sugar leaf. Knocked my damn coffee over and half of it spilled on the floor. That sucks. Uh, and I have some uh, of those cheap light panels collected up for you, uh, Gabriel. Oh, it looks like we got another no on the uh, nitrate question, but it's 15 to 85. That's not even close. All of you no people are just going to have to suck it up and listen or go do something else, I guess. You don't have to keep watching if you don't want. It's as if I, it's as if I suddenly just realized how thirsty I am. Uh, so we did all that yesterday, and then tonight I actually topped off the pond, and so the water is all the way up at its maximum depth and et cetera, et cetera. So let me turn on the sexy ambiance lights there, and then we will turn off the big glary LED light, and now we'll go around and start feeding everybody else. Let's get the uh, ham tank fed, and then if we do any work at all tonight, it's going to be on this tank. Uh, you can see this filter is back flowing pretty seriously, so I could do a filter change on that. The sponge fell out of here, so I could replace that. And we are getting a little bit of backflow, so it's never a bad idea to get in there and change out those filters as well. But again, not too worried about any of that stuff. As long as that water's flowing and I'm getting plenty of circulation, uh, that's the important thing. So let us get more of those sinking goldfish pellets. Again, trying to get rid of them. So may as well feed them since this tank's full of goldfish. And for my regular long-time viewers, if you'll remember not too long ago, remember how I kept talking about uh, the brain sack on Blackie and how all that weird white growth was all over it, and that was basically just new growth? I had been, con you know, concerned about it until I found out what it was. Well, once I found out what it was and I realized that was how much new growth was developing on his head, uh, I realized, well, that's, you know, that's indicative of how much I'm feeding the poor thing. And so I probably ought to cut back on how much I'm feeding. And so um, all right, the poll is complete since I just completed it. Um, anyway, I cut back on just a little bit about how much I was feeding the tank. And now you will notice that Blackie does not have white uh, growth all over his wen, but it is actually growing around and like down the sides of his head. It's almost starting to look like he's got uh, pork chop sideburns developing or something. So I may at some point have to figure out how to do the surgery to reduce the size of the wen. But as long as it's not over his eyeballs, I'm not going to worry too much about it. And I know he's upside down right now. He's he does that all the time. He's not 
you know, there's, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with him. Uh, as far as I can tell, he just, he's a goofball that sleeps face down and lays on his head. I've moved the rocks around so he doesn't get sort of wedged between the rocks anymore, but he still seems to be perfectly content just lying head down or even again, sort of upside down, like we're seeing him now. Um, when I first got him, he had, um, a case of hemorrhagic septicemia. And I didn't know that at first. And the people that sold it to me did not either. But as I kept watching him, it became more and more apparent that something was not right. And what I realized was if you look around the sort of ass end where the tail sort of flares out and everything, um, this whole end of the fish was sort of reddish pink. And around the fins and the base of the uh, ventral fins there uh, was really sort of pink and looked a little bit inflamed. And so I decided that's what I was looking at was the hemorrhagic septicemia. And so I treated the tank with a broad spectrum antibiotic for about two weeks and it cleared up and everything was fine. And so I haven't had any issues with that fish since other than it just does what you're looking at it doing. I mean, if this is the first time you're seeing this fish, it might be distressing to look at. <laughs> it looks like it's dying or something, but I assure you that's perfect. It does that all the time. It's like, it's been like that since I've had it. And that's probably been what, over a year now. I mean, these two fish, not the black one, that was a gift. That was the one that sort of started it all for me. But the other two, the, the marble one or the calico sort of one, and then the other white one, uh, both of those were tiny little things when I got them. In fact, I got the white one first and then the other one, which is just a fantail, the one in the back, the, the sort of marble colored one uh, is just a fantail. The other three are the Oranda, uh, which are a little fancier. So they might not grow as fast or something. I don't know. But this one here, the one Bruce Brown is growing like a weed. He is so big. He's already bigger than this one. And is pretty soon going to be about on par with uh, Blackie here. Because remember, Blackie looks big because he's got the giant head sack and this fabulous tail on the back of it. it. just makes him look huge. But if you actually look at the size of his belly and his body, it's not a lot different than Bruce Brown back there. And it's actually considerably smaller than Wednesday, the black one in there. Uh, the body mass on that black one, um, again, Wednesday here, the black one is much, much larger than uh, Blackie. I know it's confusing if you're not familiar with these fish, but the black one is named Wednesday and the white one is named Blackie. And there's reasons for that. If you don't know them, don't worry about it. It's not important, but there's reasons for that. All right, let me get caught up on some comments here. I probably have quite a few to at least go through. Whether I need to respond or not, I don't know, but we shall see. Holy crap, where are we? There we are. There's some stop signs. All right, let me see. Thank you, Mel. Thank you, Harley. Type of nematode. Okay. That makes sense. 27 species. Holy crap. I had no idea. I thought we had East Coast and West Coast. All right, getting caught up here. This is going to be more than just water science. Two starry night reed frogs. That sounds awesome. You voted no, Mel? <clears throat> or are you just telling other people they were outvoted? Oh, great. I'm getting whirly gigs on my tablet. I hope you guys aren't. I know you're making a joke there, Shirley, but communism is as democratic as you can possibly can't get any more democratic than communism. But we'll save that for a different video. Mm. 
nitrate nitrate is not bacteria all right salient you better sit down and pay attention because if you think nitrate or bacteria hang on brother you got a lot to learn nitrate or not bacteria uh, nitrate is just simply nitrogen and oxygen bound together that's all nitrate is it's not uh it starts out as ammonia it's it's the, all of that stuff whether it's ammonia nitrite nitrate it's all just nitrogenous compounds it's nitrogen and oxygen and it just depends on how many oxygens are attached to it uh, two oxygens makes it ammonia three oxygens makes it nitrite and four oxygens makes it uh, nitrate but it's just uh nitrogen and oxygen Yeah, we were just talking about that, Shamu. All right, I am getting there. Uh, the fantail, the one we were just looking at, Bruce Brown, is I'm going to guess maybe a year to a year and a half old. I haven't had him that long. Uh, interesting, Shirley. I was just getting ready to say your if you dropped it, those little containers will bounce further than you think, and they will roll further than you think. So look around. Uh, you probably knocked it off the edge of the table, and it bounced and rolled somewhere, and it's probably further away from where, and you're probably scratching your head as to where the hell it got off to, but it's there somewhere. Slossers, hello. I know it was supposed to be a joke, but don't joke about politics to me. I don't take them funny. <laughs> you want to you want to throw this uh, live stream down the wrong, make a wrong turn, start talking politics, mention it, and see what happens. That's one of my uh, subjects that I'm always terrified somebody's going to say something that's going to throw me off on the wrong uh, track. Because as I've said many, many times, fish keeping and uh, weed are my second and third hobbies. Andrew, hello. Yes, yeah, Slossers, I've had some missing crayfish turn up in <laughs> places that you wouldn't think. They make it really far before they finally die. All right, I am caught up, so if somebody can slap me a stop sign, we will move on uh, to the next tank. Wow, it's almost 8.30 already. Time is already flying by. Um, so, all right, if you just tuned in, we are going to be talking in depth about nitrate. Um And just all things nitrate. We're going to talk about nitrate in the aquarium. We're going to talk about nitrate in your groundwater. We're going to talk about nitrate in your food. Uh, we're going to talk about nitrate in the environment, uh, how it's dangerous, who it's dangerous to, why and when it's dangerous, etc. If you think you know about nitrate, you just wait till the end of tonight's live stream. You're going to know more about nitrate than you ever wanted to, I assure you, or at least you ever thought you wanted to. <clears throat> I cannot count the amount of hours I spent digging into nitrate. And that's the dis most disappointing thing. Again, if you missed the beginning opening sequence, I was talking about a video I watched recently where it was promoted as there was this new study done about nitrate. Uh, and it turns out it was not technically a new study. We'll get into that. Um, but I came away from the whole video with not one iota not one single bit of new information that i did not go into that video with and i found that to be disappointing and again what i did come away with the information wasn't wrong necessarily but it again should have just had a great big asterisk next to it and it did not so so it came away as a little bit on the uh, misleading side if you didn't really know what you were hearing you would have misunderstood what you were hearing 
And so we'll talk about all that. <clears throat> so prepare yourselves in about another half an hour. Or so once I sit down uh, around nine o'clock, probably we'll get started on all that. And we're just starting off hitting on the bowl for now. <coughs> we can do some dabs here in a little bit. Blah, the homegrown's rough. <coughs> Even with the oil on it, that homegrown is uh, rough. Cecil, hello. How do we get in the club there, Zine? Oh, that was a joke. I'm sorry, Salient. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, I, from based on some of the comments I get, I don't put anything past anybody and I don't make as, assumptions that things are jokes. I've done that in the past. And then people are like, what are you laughing at? What's so funny? I'm like, oh shit, I thought you were kidding. You know? And so I don't want to do that. I don't want to make somebody, you know, I don't want to laugh at them and assume they were kidding and then find out like, no, I was serious. And of course, when you put stuff in text, uh, as opposed to, person-to-person -person communication, you lose all subtlety, you lose facial expression, tone, uh, and everything else. And so it makes it rather difficult to pick up on the subtleties of jokes like that. So my apologies. I'm probably not the best at picking up on subtleties of facial expressions and stuff. And, uh, you know, I'm probably not the best at reading the room as it is. Uh, nitrate is certainly used as a, in explosions. And the reason nitrate is used in explosions is remember what I just said. Um, nitrate is a nitrogen plus four oxygens attached to it. So if you put it in an energetic enough uh, reaction and you suddenly release four oxygens off of that nitrogen, that's a lot of free oxygen instantly available. And therefore your ammonium nitrate or whatever is your oxidizer in an explosive uh, concoction like that. So nitrate is very much used in explosives. Nitrous oxide in your car is the exact same thing. When it goes into your engine and it gets exposed to the heat of the engine, the nitrous oxide breaks apart and you have a little bit of uh, inert nitrogen, which is what most of the air is made out of anyway. And then you have all of this oxygen that is suddenly broken free from the nitrogen and is no longer bound up because um, nitrous oxide itself is not flammable. But once you break that nitrogen off and you allow all that oxygen to become free, you've got a lot of flammable oxygen that gets dumped right down the throat of your engine. And so that's why uh, these nitrogenous compounds are used in explosives and things like that. It's the oxygen you're getting uh, from it. Three people in the club. I don't even know how to get in the club. Can you snort nitrate? Uh, probably. You can put it in the form of sodium nitrate and snort it, but I bet it would burn like shit. <laughs> um, nitrate is present in processed food only because it is used as a preservative uh, in the form of sodium nitrate. They don't want to put sodium chloride in the food to preserve it like we used to do back in the day. We'd salt our food and that would prevent bacteria from growing. So they want the high sodium levels to keep the um, you know, bacteria from forming and whatnot. That helps preserve the food, but they don't want the chloride because that would make it taste really, really salty. And so what they do is they use sodium nitrate uh, again, the nitrate being harmless and the sodium is what's actually acting as the preservative. And so it's sort of like the equivalent of salting your food without preserving it in salt. You're preserving it with sodium nitrate. And so that is where you get nitrate in your processed foods. God, is there anything I don't know? Hey, Andrew, how are you doing? Uh, there are some fish that are more sensitive to nitrate than others, and we will talk about that. Um, that's got a little bit of a question mark hanging over it because there are so many species of fish out there. And out of all the studies that have been done, 
it's been done on a limited number of species. And what we have found is that different species do react differently and have different thresholds to the exposure to the nitrate. And knowing that, we have to assume that all fish around the world have different thresholds to nitrate. But even the most sensitive of fish that they've tested, uh, trout, came in not sensitive to within hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of parts per million. Um, again, nothing like your aquarium could ever get to. And so we will cover all of that as well. It's an interesting topic. It's a lot to go over and there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's probably more misinformation out there. Um, Ooh, monkey butter. That sounds good. Uh, there's probably more misinformation out there than, uh, actual information when, when you really get down to it, especially within the aquarium hobby. Um, God, I hate forums. Uh, if you're not familiar with my four, I'll, well, if you're not familiar with how I feel about forums, I'll give you the polite version and I'll just say it's the blind leading the blind. Um, but I, I can say, I think of forums as gold mines. Uh, and the reason I think of them as gold mines is because your typical gold mine, you will haul tons and tons and tons of worthless garbage out of it. And every now and again, you will get a valuable nugget of gold, uh, which makes it all worth it. If you know what you're looking for and you know how to distinguish the difference between the garbage and the gold, that's the part where everybody uh, else seems to have the, uh, the problem uh, is the sifting between the garbage and the gold. Um, and knowing whether you're, you know, whether it's good information or not, that that's, that's, that's the challenge, you know, and, and how, I don't know how to teach people how to, to find out whether it's good information or not. Um, and so again, when you get into stuff like forums, where it's just people answering questions, you know, it's one thing if you're reading a paper, um, you know, you, you can find papers that aren't even good papers, even though they're published peer reviewed papers, uh, and they might not be great uh, or 100 percent accurate. So when you get into fucking forum questions where it's anybody just talking to anybody, you really, really have to take your what you read and what you, the information you gather uh, with a grain of salt and really, really think about what you're reading and analyze it and cross reference it. Um, I read an article tonight about nitrate, and this was an actual article that was written in a magazine about health. It was a health magazine. It was an article about food, and it was an article about baby food in particular. I was I was looking into the, the nitrate in baby food, and I'll explain why uh, when we go over everything. But this article, the dude was just fucking wrong. Like, he was just wrong. And I'm just like, what, the, what am I reading? It, like... It just, it really, again, it drives home like th this was an article you would have read in the magazine. Who would read that and think this is bad information? You know, it, this wasn't like some hack website. It wasn't something your aunt posted on Facebook. This, this was an article in a health magazine. And while all of the information in it wasn't wrong, and ultimately you would come away with valuable information, you'd also come away with a lot of bad information. Um, it, the long story short, what they were saying that was so wrong was that where nitrate comes from is the dirt. And so if you don't wash your vegetables off enough when you get them, there's going to be nitrate left over on the vegetables. And even if you wash them really vigorously, there's a lot of nitrate in the soil. And so you're still probably going to have some nitrate on your, what the fuck are you talking about? The, the nitrate is in the plant. It's like the, the, the plant uses the nitrogen to make itself. That's, that's why we put nitrogen on the ground. That's why we have nitrogen in our fish tanks. And, you know, the, you, the plants pull the nitrogen out of the water. What do you think they're doing with it? You think they're magicing it, getting away? Or do you think they're actually using that nitrogen? And so, the, you know, the idea that the nitrogen is coming from the dirt that's still on the vegetables that you haven't washed properly is just asinine. You know, um, and he, he said it several times throughout the article. And then he went on to explain something I'll go into more detail about, but it's something that only happens to infants. And he explained it as though that happens to anybody. And you had to read all the way down to the bottom of this article, which I did. I really wanted to find out where this was going. And eventually he cleared up that as long as you were older than six months, everything he just explained wouldn't happen to you. Um, but again, it was just like, you know, if you didn't know what you were 
you know, if you didn't know what I knew going into that, reading that, you would have come away with that with a lot of really bad information. Um, it just, God, it frustrates me. The, the, the problem with the age of information is bad information is just as freely available as good information. And as we all know, a lie will run around the world before the truth has got time to put its boots on. So that's just that's kind of one of the disadvantages of the information age is everybody has access to bad information immediately. <clears throat> you used to have to work to spread bad information back in the day. Now it's just freely available to everybody to all and sundry. Now, Alex's video was not bad information, but it was just somewhat misleading, as I was saying. So we'll get into that once we get done feeding. We'll sit down, and I promise we will talk about this in more of a coherent fashion rather than these little cryptic, little of this, little of that kind of bullshit that I've been feeding you so far. But that's how you work a good live show is keep people interested, tease the topic, get everybody ready for it, and once we sit down, You'll hear way more about nitrate than you wanted to. All right. I am looking desperately for a stop sign. I know there's got to be one back here somewhere. Good God. Oh, here we are. I got so much to catch up on. All right, everybody. Hang on. Uh, the cute sucker fish thing that we were looking at a couple of tanks ago is a white sucker fish that's locally caught. It was about the size of my pinky when I caught it years ago. Uh, I have a clown pleco in that tank. Yes. Rolling up some monkey butter. Nice. Uh, you got that right, eyeball. We eat ridiculous, enormous, huge amounts of nitrate in our uh, food, especially when you eat salads and leafy greens and whatnot. And we will talk about that because that's one of the things that was misleading about the Um, video I watched, or where are we? Somebody did something and it scrolled me all the way to the bottom and I had to find my way back to the top once I, it's somewhere around here. There we are. Once I've owned snakes and a toad, I'm eligible to be in the club. Oh, geez, I was in that club probably before you were born then, Zine. <clears throat> 310, how are you? Yeah, the nitrate added to bacon, it's the same thing there, eyeball. It's the, the sodium nitrate. is the, It's used as a preservative. All right. <clears throat> hey, Mike, how are you this evening? Uh, did you still want that LED, Mike? Because I was actually just going to get ready to talk to Gabriel about that. If Gabriel's still with us, I know he's having Apache. Uh... Oh, yeah, there you are, Gabriel. Uh, yeah, we can eat it and the fish can swim in it. And another thing we are going to talk about, the fact that fish are swimming in it does not mean they are ingesting it. Like you, Swimming in nitrate water does not mean it doesn't absorb through their skin. So what is it doing exactly? <laughs> Collaboration, hello. I was not talking about anybody's package tonight when you, <laughs> when you popped in like we were on Friday. That was uh, perfect timing. Uh, I'm going to remember that one for a long time because that made me laugh. Yeah, I'm the same way there, Slossers. I don't really do the social media thing. I have my own Discord server on the, you know, if you're a member here, you get access to the Discord server over there. And I barely ever even do anything uh, on that, even though it's my own Discord server. So having said that, if you're interested and you like doing that kind of stuff, uh, we have a Discord server. $2.99 a month gets you access to that. Plus it will get you access to a uh, Wednesday private live stream that I do for my members only. There's usually anywhere between five and 20 of us, depending on whether it's a slow night or not. Um, but it's usually fun. Sometimes it's weird. 
<laughs> but it's usually fun uh, on Wednesday nights. And uh, it's well worth your money. I've already been in one cult. Oh, no. Ryan, how are you? Dog man, hello. Don't do it, Shamu. Exactly, don't do it. <laughs> you beat me to it, but I'm going to reinforce that one for you. Don't do it. You know you're going to regret it. Love it when a plan comes together. Um. Exactly, Mel. Exactly, eyeball. Watch out for that nitrate. Watch, <laughs> wash your broccoli off because the dirt on the broccoli is going to, like, that's where the nitrate comes from, not the roughly 2,000 parts per million nitrate that broccoli contains or nearly 3,000 parts per million that beets contain. smoking nitrogen we're all smoking the nitrogen <laughs> our atmosphere is about 70 percent nitrogen i uh, don't know what to tell you there shamu there's a lot of people out there that always say oh my um you know my i can't i have to add nitrogen so my plants will grow or whatever i do not have that problem and i don't uh i don't know how other people do have that problem well certainly there are some journalists that are lying scum but there are others that are not again it comes down to knowing how to tell the difference between people that are lying and people that are not uh, i could not read at six months either i was probably talking by then but <laughs> i was not reading by them all right where was i oh mike somebody gave away a bunch there mike fish gave away five gifts let me figure out where i was now every time somebody does that it jumps me down to the bottom and i lose my uh place there we are b12 in the soil low fish stock well yeah low fish stock and lots of plants will uh will definitely keep your nitrate low Yeah, I do have a lot of plants, but I have slow growing plants. Although I know everybody says your plants are huge and everything. That's because they're seven years of sitting there. You know, they're not fast growing plants. They're just big. And so they don't suck up a lot of nitrate. And I have fairly heavily planted, I mean, uh, stock tanks that I feed very well. So whether I've got a lot of plants or not, the, the nitrates are just going to build up. <clears throat> Yeah, see, Mel's got a dose with the potassium and the root tabs and whatnot. I never do. Hey, Neil. Yeah, I definitely have uh, plenty of nitrates in my water. Um, I've not seen a lot of his videos, Slossers, um, but I, the nitrate thing, like that was a passion for me. Like, I know what I'm talking about with nitrate. Like, that's how I got involved in this hobby. Uh, and I spent years learning about nitrate because when I got into the hobby, uh, it was it, like, you couldn't look at YouTube without somebody shooting a video about how red equals dead and nitrate is the silent killer and you're abusing your fish if the nitrate ever gets above 40 parts per million like that was the thing everybody thought that and uh, i was the first person that i know of there may be other people out there that were saying it but i was the first person that i know of that ever started saying that nitrates are not bad for your fish or not harmful for your fish um seven eight years later father fish comes along and starts saying it and now everybody tells me i ought to watch father fish's videos uh, cause I could learn from him about how the nitrates aren't going to hurt my fish. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> I figured that shit out years ago. I still personally take credit for shifting that mentality in the hobby. I don't know if it's true or not, but damn it, I'm going to take credit for it. All right. Welcome aboard all my new people. If whether you're new or we're coming back, 
So I'm going to say thank you, Mike, for all of those, but I got to get caught up. We're on a branded account. Interesting. Uh, the YouTube picks who gets those anyway. The club predates your birth because I was already a club member in waiting. I was in stasis waiting for you to be born so I could join the club that was yet to be. That's how awesome I am. Um, I, well, we'll see there, Mike. Hang on a minute. We'll get to that LED in just a minute, and then I'll sit down. We're almost done feeding everybody. In fact, let's move on and keep feeding everybody. We're not going to bother looking at the 29. Uh, that tank just has a lot of glare on it. It's hard to see. Butterbean's already eaten twice today. I've noticed that since Butterbean's teeth have gotten long and I'm having trouble feeding him, I've been feeding him so much just to make sure he gets fed that I swear he's bigger and fatter now than he was before I noticed his teeth were starting to get boogered up. And so I really need to get his teeth fixed. I just, I need to be in the right brain space for it. And I just have not recently. So we're just giving these guys some vibra bites and Gilgalad's in there somewhere. I just saw, there he is. He's making his way over. See, I saw him in there a minute ago. Let me give him some food now that all the other stuff's already sunk. All right, let me see where I was. Uh, let's see. My britches are friggin' huge. <laughs> <laughs> the britches of my mind. <laughs> uh, the Discord is an app you have to install on your phone or whatever. And then once you're a member, you can go to the members area uh, on my channel. And there's a link over there that will link you to my particular Discord page uh, or Discord server. But you have to be... Uh, you have to have the Discord app installed on your uh, phone or whatever to go on to Discord, but you need my link to go onto my Discord server specifically. I knew what you were trying to get out there, Christopher. <laughs> Mei Ling, how are you? Yeah, I did some of my own uh, experimenting with the, uh, what kind of moss? I'm not sure what tank you were looking at when you asked what kind of moss. Probably the Garami tank, and that is Java moss in that one. Hello, by the way, Captain Andrew. I've not seen you before, so welcome aboard. Uh, what kind of plants do you have, Laura? I doubt your plants are suffering from lack of blue light. Um, when people talk about blue light and red light and all that, I've said this before, the, the vast, vast majority of the time you can just disregard that. Unless you're growing marijuana, you don't need to worry about blue light and red light and all that shit. And even then, if you're growing marijuana with any kind of modern equipment like I am, you don't need to worry about it anyway, because the blue light, red light thing was what we grew weed with way back in the day when you had a very limited amount of light sources. And so you made the best of what you had. You didn't have this big full spectrum stuff. So when plants were growing out and vegging, 
they do need red and blue light, but they tend to use more blue light. And so you would use like a 6,500K uh, bulb, just you're sacrificing the red, but they need more blue when they're vegging. And then when they would switch into flowering, it's the other way around. They you they still need blue, but they need more red. And so you sacrifice the blue by giving it the more red 2700 K where you got a lot more red light in it, but you're sacrificing the blue. Now you don't have to sacrifice anything. My shit gets full spectrum from seedling to, to harvest. And you know, uh, I can tweak it. I can give it extra red when it's in the flowering if I want, or I can focus on blue when it's in the, you know, but it just doesn't really need it as long as it's getting full spectrum. If you're growing house plants or if you're growing plants in a terrarium or you're growing aquarium plants or whatever, none of those need the kind of lighting that you need to grow weed. Remember, weed is a, um, you know, it's a cash crop plant. It's like growing corn uh, or oranges or something like that. It takes a huge amount of light to produce these big, heavy flowers. Um, you know, think of like growing roses or something like that indoors you can't do that with shop lights, you know, or just little, uh, overhead, you know, uh, lighting, you need serious lighting for these kind of things. And that, you know, when you don't, can't afford the serious lighting and you got to do it with fluorescence, you maximize. And so you, you worry about the 2,700 K versus the 6,500, you know, again, that was just back in the day and it was, you know, out of necessity for growing very, very heavy light need plants, the kind of plants we grow, if you've got a decent spectrum LED type light over it, it should be getting plenty of all kinds of light that it needs. Uh, it should just be fine with that. All right, let me keep going here. Hey, cool guy. Yeah, planting legumes like peas or lima beans or something will fix the nitrates. Hey, Kendra. Well, there's definitely, I'm not saying that nitrates have no impact in your water, but again, we will get to that. I, I've got a lot to go over with nitrate. Believe me, I got, it's, I got information for you. I'm going to drop some knowledge on you about nitrate. Uh, Butterbean is uh, still in his tank there, Mei Ling. My discus are not particularly picky eaters. My discus are basically, um, if you took an angelfish and you just rolled them out flat a little bit and turned, made them round, that's kind of how I feel about my discus. They're about as challenging to um, maintain as angelfish. Man, we went from almost 50 people to 39 people in three minutes. Did I say something? Uh, maybe my audio and video stopped. That's why. Uh, let me see. I'm trying to get caught up here. Uh, Butterbean will probably not eat trumpet snails because the shells are so hard, but I'm going to try. I think Mel sent me some trumpet snails. Did you send me trumpet snails or ram's horn, uh, Mel? There you go, Zine. <laughs> All right. Let me keep going here. I don't necessarily need to respond to all these. And I have a feeling I've still got a long way to go. Yeah, any kind of modern LED, even if it's a lower quality LED, is going to give you close enough to full spectrum that you should be fine with the kind of plants that we have uh, growing in our uh, aquariums. Yeah, you could use incandescent bulbs, but that's a really soft, you got a lot of red in the incandescent bulbs. Um, if you had money and you could mitigate the heat 
and you could afford the electricity and everything, you would use the high pressure sodiums and the metal halides. Um, but again, you're still switching up. The high pressure sodiums give you that soft 2700 K kind of light. And then the metal halide gives you that bright white uh, sort of bluish 6500 K light. Yeah, that's a bummer, Cheryl. I'm sorry to hear it. All right, I am trying hard to get caught up here. Your angelfish destroyed duckweed? Interesting. Oh, spotted Congo puffer. Awesome. One day I will have a big puffer. Butterbean is my biggest puffer. And we'll be looking at the discus tank again here in a minute once I sit down in front of it. Uh, Butterbean has already fed, but that's my puffer, and it's a figure eight puffer. Um, I'll throw a shrimp in there for him. Break it up. You can tear it in a couple little chunks so he can eat it again. His teeth are getting long. I need to do the surgery to trim his teeth up. Now, once he figures out there's food there. Oops, sorry. All right, let me see. Keep going here. Uh, Amy, you go to the members area and there will be uh, a link over there in the members area somewhere. Yeah, you're going to need a lot of light to get all that tank lit up there, Shamu. Hey, I'm all caught up. Somebody slapped me a stop sign there. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, pea puffers definitely have a lot of personality for being a uh, little fish. Yeah, it sucks being a teenager. Everything is uh, exaggerated, especially emotions and drama. <laughs> I remember all too well. Worst years of my life. I hated being a teenager. Anybody that tells you being a teenager is the best years of your, your life, they're lying to you. I know there's some aspects of it that are nice, like being made out of health. You know, and you fall down, you bounce back up onto your feet. If you manage to get a bruise, it goes away in two days. <laughs> you can stay awake for days at a time, get three hours of sleep, and be good to go again. I do enjoy that aspect of being a teenager, but that is the only aspect. And even that comes with its downsides. You got to eat like you've never eaten before. I remember being a teenager and just being so hungry all the time. I could not eat enough food. That's obviously as I was going through my growth spurt, probably 15 or something. <clears throat> I tell you, I wouldn't want to have to pay for the food that a teenage boy eats. <coughs> but yeah, otherwise being a teenager sucks. Just say, how do we get talking about teenager? I remember. All right, everybody. We are about to sit down and begin our nitrate discussion. If you've been waiting patiently, I appreciate it. I just wanted to make sure we got all the tanks fed. And again, we can skip any uh, maintenance we would have needed to do. So we're pretty much good to go. So I am going to cop a squat. Exactly, Pavilion. All that, all that money just goes right into food. <laughs> you may as well just flush the money right down the toilet. Save the middleman. All right, let me get you set up so we can have some actual FaceTime. <coughs> 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 
<coughs> Let me get my lungs sorted out. Do I have everything I need? I got my tablet. I got my bong. No, I don't have my bong. But I don't need my bong. Got my phone. Got my lighter, my torch. I think we're good to go. All right, everybody. Let me make sure you got a good view of my charming, smiling face. <laughs> Even though that was a terrifyingly fake smile. Oh, where was I? There I was. Mmm, slushy. I don't ever remember my voice going through the crackly weird stage. I'm sure it did. I just don't really remember it. <laughs> Still hasn't got that pack of smokes yet, Mike. <laughs> yeah, I got into weightlifting a little bit when I was 18. I definitely bulked up then. Yeah. Well, the invincibility thing and knowing every goddamn thing is uh, not necessarily uh, one of the benefits of being a teenager. I know it feels awesome thinking you know every damn thing in the world, but it can run you into some problems sometimes. And, of course, knowing that you're invincible and you're going to live forever, which is another trait of uh, being a teenager, um, that can get you into trouble, especially uh, in young men. We are not the best at... Uh, you know, impulse control and judgment when we're teenagers. <clears throat> yeah. Well, as long as they're still your boys, Laura, they'll always need mom to feed them. I go over to my mom's house from time to time, and first thing she does, ask me if I want something to eat, and now I'm good. That's true, Shane, man. Boys break stuff. I wonder how angelfish do taste. <laughs> they, probably, they probably taste similar to uh, sunfish. Aha, I got you again, Laurel. Didn't I thwart you from your uh, work on Friday? No option. No, it's not an option. You just have to find the link. I think it's posted somewhere. Um, a lot of times you can find it on the Wednesday members chat. If you scroll through the comments, I'll get over there in the members area and post it somewhere permanently. I thought D-Law had done that. Um, uh, I did hear from D-Law tonight. He posted on Discord, as a matter of fact, for anybody that didn't read that. Um He's on the third shift and he has to sleep and he used to try to, to hang out on Sunday nights a little bit, but it would throw his whole schedule off and then that would just fuck his Monday night up. And, and so he kind of has to stay on his sleep schedule, uh, which I understand. And so he is still thinking about us and so on and so forth. So I've been thinking about him. So it was glad, I'm glad to hear from him. Um, but I thought D-Law, who's sort of my technical manager when it comes to all this, I really miss having him around. Um, I thought he had posted a link over there somewhere permanently. So I'll see about that. Um, but there, there, it's over there somewhere. Somebody can find it or help you find it. <clears throat> all right, everybody. 904, you can stop sign me and we will get started talking about the nitrate pretty much on time. So the first thing that I will say we're going to talk about is we're going to sort of be gearing it around uh, why I'm thinking about nitrate at the moment. And then we can kind of get over that and we'll talk about nitrate in general. But I just watched a video recently uh, from Alex, uh, Secret, Fish, uh, Secret History Living in Our Fish Tanks. And there was a couple aspects of the video that I found a little uh concerning they they were sort of misleading and it, it made me i don't know if i want to shoot like a video about it i just i honestly don't know if i care that much anymore i've shot so many videos about nitrate and been called a fish killer and a murderer and you know uh so many things for for acting like nitrate aren't deadly poison to your fish anyway we're going to talk about it tonight 
The first thing that his video says that I found a little misleading was that he said there's a new study out that's, you know, it's revealed this new stuff about nitrates. I was like, oh, that sounds interesting to me. I'm always, you know, I've read every damn thing I can find about nitrate over the years and I don't know of anything new. And so there's this new study. Well, it's not really a new study. What it is, is a meta study. And if you know how science and studies and stuff work, uh, that's fine. But if you don't, what a meta study is, is sort of a collection of all studies that have already been done. And it compiles all the data from all of the stuff. And then it looks at the data. So if this study did this test sample and it looked at that aspect of nitrate and, you know, this study did this group of people and that study did that group of people. And this one looked at the, the impact it has on cows. And this one looked at the impact it has on soil. Um, you know, this meta study looked at all of those studies, whether it was about fish or whether it was about impacts on the soil. It just took every study it could find about nitrate and, and the nitrogen cycle and, and all this and just and, you know, health, health related stuff, uh, both in our diet and, and water system and in the aquatic diet and water system. And. It compiled all that data, and what it came up with was, the long story short, his end result was that the, uh, the study suggested that we limit our intake to uh, between 50 and 60 parts per million, and likewise goes for our aquariums. Our aquariums are pretty much fall in that same category, since, you know, fish and people are so similar, if... 50 to 60 parts per million is the safe recommended amount for humans, then that's probably a good safe amount for your fish too. So after 15 minutes of video, that was the conclusion. Keep your aquarium between 50 and 60 parts per million and you'll be fine. And that does, that doesn't make any sense to me. It just, that, that makes no sense to me at all. Again, if you eat, any kind of leafy green material, it is loaded with nitrate. Broccoli has over 2,000 parts per million nitrate. Um, beets have almost 3,000 parts per million nitrate. When you, you think you're getting a lot of nitrate when you eat processed food like bacon and stuff we were talking about earlier, and you got nothing on leafy greens. You want nitrate in your diet, eat a lot of salad eat kale, eat dark green uh, vegetables like broccoli and spinach. You will have so much nitrate in your diet. It's unbelievable. Now, having said that, nitrate's good for you in a lot of ways. We need nitrate. Um, men in particular take nitrate and we process it into something called uh, nitric acid. That's nitric acid. And that is used, well, it's used to be something for specifically men uh, do and nobody else. And you need that nitric acid to do that. So if you want sort of a natural boost uh, in your virility, you are much, much better off instead of being all manly and eating steak and all that dumb shit, go eat a lot of salad and crank up your nitrate intake. And that might not be the only thing that gets up because that's what you need nitrate for. And nitrate helps with your blood thinning and all that when you're having chest pains and whatnot. What do they do? They give you uh, nitroglycerin. Why are they giving you nitroglycerin? They're trying to get those nitrates into your system really quickly. Um, <clears throat> by the way, if you have taken uh, Viagra or Cialis or something similar, and you're having chest pains, let them know you have taken one of those medications. Because if you take uh, nitrate on top of those medications, your blood pressure will fall through the floor and you may die from that. Do not take chest pain nitrate uh, pills if you have taken a uh, erectile dysfunction medication within the last eight hours or so. Bad combination of uh, nitrogen compounds in your body. So don't do that. Um, so again, we get tons of nitrate in our diet every day, all the time. How is he coming away at the end of this video by saying 50 to 60 parts per million nitrate in what? In our diet, in our drinking water? 
in specific, like it just it doesn't make any sense in parameters of you know in in fish tank like i understand you can test the water what do you mean my limit for nitrate is 40 to 60 parts per million is that over the course of a day is that per meal uh is it per food it just doesn't make any sense so the only the only time a human being ever has any problem with nitrate is when you're an infant Within the first six months of your life, your body lacks an enzyme that helps. Uh, let's see, if you get excess amounts of nitrogen or nitrate in your body, that nitrate begins to get processed into nitrite. Now, nitrite is toxic. And what nitrite does is it binds with your hemoglobin and it turns it into something meth methemoglobin methoglobin it modifies the hemoglobin and so even though that hemoglobin or methoglobin can still bond with oxygen it does not readily release that oxygen and so it just stays bound up with the oxygen rendering that red blood cell fairly useless so extreme amounts of nitrogen or nitrate in your diet can cause it to start turning into nitrite in your bloodstream, which can then cause this issue with your oxygen. However, we have an enzyme in our cells that turns that back into hemoglobin. So we don't have any problem with it. You can eat all the damn nitrate you want. As long as you're older than six months old, prior to the age of six months old, little baby infants don't have very much of that enzyme and excessive amounts of nitrate can lead to, uh, it's called blue baby uh, disease or blue baby syndrome. It's uh, meth methoglobin anemia, I think is what it actually is, the, the medical condition. But it's, it's a condition where the nitrite is not being broken away again. And the, the baby's blood begins to just sort of be used up with this oxygen that it can't release. And the baby's not getting proper oxygenation to its cells and their lips and fingertips and stuff like that will start turning blue. And in some cases, it can even lead to death or brain damage if it's not, you know, if it's severe enough. So that and that time alone is when nitrate is bad for humans. And for that reason and that reason alone we regulate what the amount of nitrate that is allowed to be in your drinking water. So the federal government has it regulated at 10 parts per million, or the EPA recommends that. Not all states necessarily follow that recommendation, but most states will be under 11 or 12 parts per million is going to be the most you're going to see pretty much in any state. All of the states regulate how much uh, nitrate is allowed to be in your well water or in your drinking water uh, or whatever. The reason is you may use that water to mix up your baby's formula and give your baby excessive nitrogen if it's, you know, in your well water uh, or something like that. After six months, it doesn't matter. But because of that six month window, we have to regulate it because you just never know. You can't say, oh, it doesn't matter how much, you know, nitrates in the water. Adults can handle it because you never know. An infant may get exposed to that water and it could kill an infant. And so we do regulate it at 10 parts per million. But that's only because of this blue baby syndrome. Um, so when I, when, you know, at the end of this video where it says, you know, 40 to 60 parts per million for humans, like that, that how that doesn't make sense. And so I asked him in the video, I said, I, I, I know babies can't, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And when he responded to me, he says, well, yeah, that's the reason, um, you know, they say 50 to 60 parts per million is because of infants. And, you know, he didn't say anything about that in the video. And he still isn't making clear, is that 50 to 60 parts per million over the course of a 24-hour period? Is it that per meal? Um, I, I don't know what, what that really means, at, at regulating humans at 40 to, to, to 60 parts per million or whatever he came away with. So that doesn't really make any sense. And then as far as the fish, the fish is almost the exact same scenario. There are some species of fish where the fry are very sensitive to nitrate. In some situations, fry have died in exposure to less than 10 parts per million nitrate. 
once they're no longer fry, they don't seem to have any issues with it. Now, the species that get tested are usually the same group of species. You usually have salmon thrown in there because that's a big aquaculture species and it pays to study that one. You will get trout thrown in there because trout are traditionally considered a very sensitive species. And you often get bullhead minnows tested because bullhead minnows are considered to be a very hardy species. And so with trout, even the testing with trout and trout, again, are just known to be sensitive fish. You ask people that you just even ask someone who's a fisherman and doesn't know anything about uh, biology or anything. They just know that if there's water that's got trout swimming in it, it's pristine water. It's stable water. Like you got to have special water to have trout living in it. Trout can live in over 900 parts per million nitrate without any issue whatsoever. Literally, like it just it does not bother them. <laughs> The bullhead minnows could live in water at, at, at like 4,000 parts per million. Um, there's no way, I don't care how neglected your aquarium ever gets, you're never going to get eight, 900 parts per million in your aquarium. You may get a few hundred uh, parts per million, but you just can't build it up indefinitely the nitrate will begin to get broken down in other ways or else your tank will just become so unkempt that it's funky i mean again the 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 amount of food you would have to put in there the lack of maintenance the you know what you would have to do to an aquarium you'd kill the fish just from fouled water and lack of oxygen and whatnot before the nitrate would ever poison them. It's sort of like the salt and the iodide, you know, people worry about the little bit of iodide that's in, in table salt. If you're, if you're putting so much salt in the water that the iodide is having an effect on them, you've already pickled the fish in saline, you know, or, or, or in brine basically. Um, so if, if you manage to get your nitrate high enough in your aquarium, then it's going to really start hurting your fish in an, in, a, in an acute sense, you know, in a here and now they're going to die. If you don't get them out of that water kind of sense, um, you have to take sodium nitrate or you have to, to do it in a laboratory type setting where you have to artificially raise those uh, nitrate levels beyond anything your tank would ever do naturally or unnaturally. So it's just not an issue in those regards. As far as long-term damage, every study I ever read, and again, this video that, you know, Alex went over it a little bit, uh, he tended to make it sound a little more ominous than I took away from it and did from the stuff that I read. But everything I read talked about, and again, you have to kind of understand science talk um, they're very careful about the language they use. And everything I read um, was about long-term exposure was liver cells, you know, were different than other liver cells, you know, didn't say what that difference was necessarily or whether it was bad form or good form or had a negative impact. Might've helped them for all we know. They were just different. You know, uh, there might've been a, a certain percentage of oxygen cells less in these fish than those fish, but was it an amount that would have impacted their health? Probably not. You know, uh, one study I read went on at length about fecundity rates, um, you know, the, 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 their ability to breed, their ability to reproduce. And this one study went on and on about the reduced fecundity rates of these fish that have been exposed to the nitrate, blah, blah, blah. And after all this paragraph of this, there's a footnote and I go all the way down and read the footnote the difference in fecundity rate fell not only within the margin of error within the test study, but also fell within the margin of variation from year to year. So what your, your test told me nothing. Your test told me nothing. You, you, you know, it, it, your test told me that the nitrate had no impact because it falls not only within the margin of error, but it falls within the normal variation of that species. So it's not a reduced fecundity rate. It's maybe reduced compared to your control group, but it's still a natural variation. So temperature might, you know, and I, I get it with the control group, but what I'm, the point I'm making is that even if the nitrate was what caused that tiny little difference in fecundity rate out in the wild, something like the temperature might do that or how clear versus how cloudy the water is. There's a lot of different things that might marginally affect the fecundity rate. So am I going to stress out 
over that in my aquarium? No, I'm not going to stress out over that little bit of impact that it may or may not be having. Um, I tend to think about it in the sense of like, all right, let's say it's affecting the fish in some kind of negative way. If I've got a fish that's supposed to live for 20 years, maybe it only might live for 19 and a half. The chances of something else killing it before that 19 and a half year, like the, the nitrate isn't going to have anything to worry about. It's like somebody the other day pointed out how when I shake the bottle, you know, I'm getting the fluid from the test and that's not good. You know what? If that little bit of exposure to chemicals is what's going to kill me, I'll eat my hat. <laughs> you know, I guarantee there's plenty of other things I've done in my life or just car accidents you name it. I, that is not the thing I'm worried about, you know, and nitrate is kind of the same thing. It may have some minor impact on the fish's health over long periods of time. If you leave them at crazy high rates all the time, but how much of a difference is it going to have? I don't know. I would think not having an air stone in your tank would have more of a negative impact on your fish than having excessive nitrate, you know? Um, and I'll also say that I'm just going to pull numbers out of my ass, just letting you know in advance, I'm just making stuff up. But if I had to guess the numbers between how many fish have died between nitrate exposure to infrequent water changes versus the number of fish that have died due to excessive water changes, I bet it's far, far more fish dying from excessive water changes and excess filter maintenance and so on and so forth. That desperate attempt, I know from my own personal experience, my, my, my desperate attempts to keep those nitrate levels low was killing my fish. I lost so many fucking fish to this over maintenance and this water changing all the time and just trying desperately. I needed to leave the tanks alone and just let them be. And when I did that, I stopped having all these problems. You know, I had other issues with other stuff over the years, but my fish stopped dying mysteriously when I stopped doing water changes three times a week. Um, so, so your fish, so the, the, the things that could impact your fish are many and varied. And while nitrate may be one of them, it's probably the least one of them you should really be worrying about. And you're going to probably do more harm to your fish by worrying so much about the nitrates than you are just leaving them the hell alone. You know, again, you're going to kill them with water changes before you're going to kill them with nitrate. Um, nitrate doesn't absorb through the skin or the gills. So if it's a thousand parts per million in the aquarium, it's not a thousand parts per million in the fish. Um, lastly, I'll add that just like when we eat green vegetables, you know, we eat all that nitrate. What do you think happens when your fish eat your plants? You know how much nitrate my silver dollars get, get in their diet? Um, algae eating fish. We, what do we talk about? Like, oh, you got excess nitrate in your tank and all that algae grows. Well, what's, what's happening? It's pulling that nitrate out. It's building the algae out of it. All that algae is in that, or, you know, all that nitrates in that algae. And then the fish comes along and eats it all. I don't care if you've got 10 parts per million algae in the water, the fish just ate you know, something that's got a thousand parts per million nitrate and it's food. It's consuming that much nitrate. And you're worried about the 50 parts per million that's in the water it's swimming in. That doesn't make any sense. You know, if you're worried about nitrate then stop it from eating the algae, because that's where it's really getting the nitrate in its body is from the algae it's eating or your plants that it's nibbling on. Um, that's got far more nitrate in it than the water column does. Nobody worries about that. And it's because nitrate's not harming your fish. It just really isn't. So I will say in conclusion that I will say what I've said all along. I've always said this since long before Father Fish ever had a YouTube channel is that if you're breeding, then you should be concerned about nitrates because there are some species where the fry are very sensitive and so on and so forth. So if you're a breeder or you're really trying to breed your fish and you're having difficulty that could be an issue and you should worry about having some nice, pristine, nitrate-free water. Otherwise, if you're just a regular person, don't worry about nitrate. If you do even reasonable water changes from time to time, once a year or something, your fish are going to be just fine. Those nitrates aren't harming them. And whatever little bit of harm they are having is just not anything you really need to concern yourself about. I'm not saying nitrates have no impact whatsoever, 
I'm just saying they don't have enough of an impact for you to necessarily worry about it. I would be more concerned about the nitrate contributing to the total dissolved solids in your water. Uh, so if you have a fish that needs to live in soft water versus hard water and that sort of thing, you've probably got more to worry about in those regards with nitrate affecting your TDS than you do with the nitrate having some sort of nitrate toxicity uh, within your fish. It's just not something we really need to worry about again. So I don't think I missed anything there. If I did, or you got any questions, let me know. I'm sure you already did. I've probably got a half an hour worth of reading to catch up here, but that's everything I can think of uh, about the nitrate for the time being anyway. So let me see where I was somewhere back here. There we go. All right. You all fight amongst yourselves for a minute. I'm going to try to get caught up here. Oh, that's interesting you say that, Slossers. Um, I was actually going to say, you know, noise probably reduces your fish's life more than nitrates does. If you play your aquarium, you know, you play your, your music loud, uh, like I do on occasion down here, sometimes it's headphones, sometimes it's my boom box. Uh, when I vacuum in here or whatever, the, the, the being startled, uh, the, the stress that that's causing or whatever, um, probably not doing a lot to reduce the lifespan of your fish, but I would say that the stress from that and the possible potential for injury from being startled and banging into something, you know, that would be a bigger concern of mine than nitrate. Turning lights on suddenly and having the fish bang into walls is probably more likely to injure your fish than the nitrate is. Didn't see his video on the, the vacuum and whatnot though. All right. No nitrate, no life, that's for sure. <laughs> I, <was gonna> say, <laughs> I like all the sudden urges for salads. <laughs> uh Yeah, wait till Wednesday. Don't uh, post a link here, Laura, because that would go out publicly and you got to be a member to get access. <laughs> so I'm telling you, I can sell a uh, salad. All I got to do is sell, sell you all on ballet now. Um, and again, I'm not a big ballet guy myself either, but I still think you should appreciate it more than you do. All right, let me see. 20 pounds of duckweed. That's a lot of nitrate removal. Home safe. Nice. Probably already asleep, Steve. Uh, if you are still awake, Steve, you got to figure out when you're going to get out here to help me dig out my pond. If we get the warm weather, I think after this week, the weather's going to break. Four inches a day, damn. That would be a stanky tank. Hey, 808. Purple haze, nice. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Is there any arguments that nitrates in the form of water versus in the tank? Um, not that I know of. Again, in the water column, it's not really absorbing. Nitrite will absorb through their gills. Um, again, nitrite is dangerous to your fish. Nitrite is poisonous. And that's how that was the first thing that I that cued me into the idea that I'm on the right track, that this nitrate thing is a bunch of bullshit because if you look up 
how does ammonia poison my fish? You can see exactly what ammonia does to your fish to kill them. If you look up what does the nitrite do to my fish, you will see exactly what nitrite does to your fish to kill them. What does nitrate do to my fish? Eh, yeah, well, a little, maybe kind of, we need more study. It sort of does this and people seem to believe and like nothing. You get nothing. There's no science that shows that nitrate has any negative impact besides these, oh, when we expose these fish to huge amounts of nitrate that you'll never possibly expose them to, we notice some slight changes in their liver function okay, that's not really telling me a lot, is it? You know, but that's the kind of stuff you find when you start looking into what does nitrate do to my fish. Um, again, nitrate, I can tell you what it does. I already told you what nitrate does when it gets in your blood and blocks all the oxygen. Same thing happens in fish. Um, that's why you have to be concerned about nitrite. Ammonia burns up their gills and does all kinds of stuff to them. Got to be careful of ammonia. <laughs> um, nitrate is not, you know, it's just not, it's not the same thing. <clears throat> Nitrate killed your dinosaur. Oh, no. I know like nitrate. See, back in the day, nitrate was blamed on everything, too. Um, what's wrong with male, male ballet dancers? I actually had to laugh the other day uh, on Friday night when I was talking about um, ballet. And I was talking about the, you know, you get to sit there and listen to all this great music and then you get to just watch all these beautiful bodies on stage dancing around or whatever um i wasn't thinking about it in sexual terms at all i'm just thinking about from an anatomical point of view an impressive body is an impressive body you know um but everything i described i i i, I like went at length and described the men and the males bodies i didn't want to describe uh one of the women on stage and i'm thinking i wonder what people came away thinking from that one um and then i had to laugh because i don't care um but yeah, I don't. What's what's wrong with the uh, male ballet dancers? Russell, you're back. CO two generator system, nice. <laughs> exactly, the dinosaurs. Uh, they could pull the carrots up, you know, with their little teeth, but then they couldn't wash the nitrate off that was in the dirt, and then they died. Aquarium, how are you? Aquarium Talk TV, nice to you of you to join us. Hope you enjoy yourself. All right, I must have missed something. I feel like I've gone way past where I was, and I'm all the way at the bottom now. No, I must be caught up. Well, I'm all caught up there. Boy, you guys were listening more than I thought to all that rambling. Yeah, I read that. I read that. Got all that. All right, that's where I was. <laughs> One part per billion. <clears throat> now, I did find it interesting in Alex's video that he said that um, marine fish are much, much more sen uh, um, resistant to nitrate they're less sensitive to it whereas i've always been under the impression that it's the other way around now i don't know if it's the fish necessarily but i know a marine ecosystem is very sensitive to nitrate fluctuation you fuck up a marine ecosystem by having a little bit of excess um nitrate in it Well, when the fish are breathing fast like that at the surface, like they're gasping for air, it's usually ammonia exposure. And what happens is the ammonia is damaging the gill tissue and then the gill tissue uh, can't do the gas exchange like it's supposed to. And so the fish is responding as though there's not enough oxygen in the water because it's not getting enough gas exchange in its blood. And so it's up near the surface uh, gasping for air because its gills aren't working properly because of being burned up by the ammonia. Um, 
So actually, I am caught up. So let me get a stop sign. I'm going to do me a dab. In fact, I'm going to get my oil rig. I'm going to do a real dab. And we're going to talk about nitrate in the environment a little bit too, because that's a topic that comes up a lot. And it is a valid topic because nitrate can be very destructive to waterways in particular. Um, I, living near the Chesapeake Bay, have had a lifetime of hearing, <laughs> thank you, Shamu. Um, I have had a lifetime of hearing about, um, you know, clean up the bay and all that kind of stuff. They really began that in earnest when I was a child back in the 1970s, um, you know, right after they invented the light bulb, apparently. And it's, it, it's been interesting. It, it's really been an interesting journey. For one thing, it's a real challenge because there are seven states that fall within the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And some of them states like New York, for example, don't have any part of the Chesapeake Bay in them. Pennsylvania doesn't have any part of the Chesapeake Bay in it, yet runoff from Pennsylvania flows into the Chesapeake Bay. So how do we work with Pennsylvania, or rather, how do we get Pennsylvania to work with us about, you know, and so that aspect of it's been challenging. And the other aspect that's been the most interesting and challenging is that back in the 70s, when we were going to clean up the bay, um, you know, things like Love Canal, uh, we're still fresh in people's mind. If you're not familiar with Love Canal, back in the day, rivers used to catch on fire back before the EPA started regulating waste and pollutant and stuff like that. And so much shit got dumped in the rivers, petrochemicals and waste products and stuff like that, that rivers would regularly catch on fire and burn. And there was one, there was a fire that was so bad that, that burned so much of the waterfront and whatnot that they finally said, you know what, maybe we should regulate this kind of stuff and, and, and stop people from doing this. And that's when the EPA came around and we started trying to clean things up. And so by the seventies, what we were still thinking for the Chesapeake Bay was going to be that it was going to be chemicals and factories and things like that, that was going to be the real pollutant. And what we found and this is pretty much true the world over, is it's the agriculture industry, the farms and the, and the fertilizers and the, and the animal waste. And so whether you're growing stuff like corn, um, you know, or soybeans or whatever, um, you know, you're, you're, you're dumping the fertilizer on the ground, which seeps in, runs off, et cetera. Or if you're growing cattle, sheep, goats, chickens, whatever, the Eastern shore is Tend to, there's probably more chickens on the eastern shore than there are people on the east coast. Um, the, the, the eastern shore of Maryland is like Tyson, um, um, Purdue, all that shit is down on the eastern shore of Maryland. And the, the, the chicken waste is super high in nitrogen and then all is running into the bay. And so the agricultural industry puts a lot of these pollutants into the bay. And in, you know, it's just... It, it's difficult to do anything with the agriculture industry because despite the fact that it's really giant agriculture, big business, these people are no different than giant fucking corporations, but we think about them as farmers and we think of mom, pa, kettle uh, or, you know, your local farmers down the street or whatever. And you're like, oh, shucks, golly, don't, don't be mean to them. And, you know, we're not you're like, but you, but you can't even bring it up. It's, it's difficult to even discuss the agricultural industry because they immediately try to start portraying it as though, oh, we're just a bunch of farmers and we produce your food and don't bother us. And it's just a bunch of giant corporations that are doing this. Um, so that, so it's a challenge. It's, it's a challenge to actually get anything to change within, you know, the farming community. And so that's where all of this stuff happens. But what happens when all this nitrate gets into the water, what is it doing to these bodies of water? You hear about all the death it causes and, and the fish are dying because of all the nitrate and all that. So how is that happening if the nitrate's not harmful? Why is it killing these waterways and why is it killing fish and so on and so forth? Let me do this dab and I will explain all that because there are reasons why, you know, excessive nitrates will 
uh, destroy waterways and kill fish and so on and so forth. The main damage it does to waterways is it just messes up the ecosystem. You'll have way too much algae growing or the plants will outgrow the habitat or breeding areas will get ruined. Um, and so species will start dying off because their breeding habitats have been altered um, by the, the growth and stuff like that. So it's not necessarily toxic in and of itself, even in the environment, but can have all of these secondary and even tertiary effects on populations because of other impacts that it's having, eutrophication being the worst of them. That was a huge rip. <laughs> so eutrophication is where we have mass fish deaths. When you see those pictures where there's like just dead fish floating in everywhere, um, that is caused by nitrate and it's through a process called eutrophication. And it's got, well, I won't say it has nothing to do with the nitrate, but it's not because the nitrate is poisonous. What happens What happens is you will get uh, you'll, you'll get a flood of nitrate will come into an area of water. You'll get almost like a, a dead zone area where the nitrate sort of accumulates in like a bay or a harbor or something like that. And when the nitrate levels get high enough, it'll sort of trigger uh, an algal bloom and you'll get green water. <laughs> so like you do, you know, in an aquarium, sometimes you'll get that algal bloom. And you'll get all this green water. That in and of itself is not that big of a deal. In fact, a lot of fish eat that, you know, algae and, and so on and so forth. But what happens is that algae then blooms, gobbles up all the available nitrate and phosphate in the water, runs out of food, dies, and then falls to the bottom. And now you've got this thick mat of decaying organic material at the bottom of this area of water you know again it might be just a little pocket within the larger bay or the larger harbor or whatever you'll get this little pocket where there's not a lot of flow and the conditions will be just right you'll get this bloom you'll get this die off it'll all fall to the bottom and remember what i always say about the 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 stuff being broken down in your aquarium that's an aerobic process it uses oxygen and there ain't no air stones out in the bay or wherever. And so you've got this mat of decaying uh, uh, organic material. It uses all the oxygen out of the water. And so you get this dead zone where there's no oxygen in the water because it's all been used up by this decaying material. And all the fish that swim into it just die. And then they're dead. They, they swim into it and they don't swim back out the other side of it, depending on how big you know, th this dead zone is and, and slowly the water will disperse and so on and so forth and it'll go away. Um, but that's the process of eutrophication. And that is how nitrate will just outright kill fish, even though it's not the nitrate uh, itself that's doing it. But this process that's set in motion uh, due to these excessive nitrates that get into uh, these bodies of water. <coughs> Excuse me. Other than that, Again, it's, it's the disruption of the habitat. It's the excessive algal growth. It's the excessive weeds and stuff like that that are on uh, the bottom or growing over, even overhanging the side and growing down into the water or whatever uh, that, that will just alter the, the habitat. It'll change the water flow. Um, you know, again, it'll change the amount of nutrients that are available for other plants. It can change breeding grounds, etc. So a lot of stuff going on with the nitrates. Hey, DS. <clears throat> All right, let me see. Duckweed is definitely full of nitrate because that's some fast growing stuff there. Duckweed's a good food source. You mean for people or for goldfish because my goldfish eat the shit out of duckweed in fact i put a whole bunch of duckweed in there this evening and it's gone already and i do mean this evening it was like 6 30 
going to do the dab. Nice DS. You <coughs> <coughs> little chicken waste. <laughs> Yeah, good old Monsanto, your local mom. <laughs> You've seen that picture of, uh, you know, the farmer. That's Monsanto, right? Um, I'm going to call bullshit on that one, Shamu. Your water should not be affected by a simple rainstorm or whatever. Um if you're on city water, it will be regulated, so it's going to be the same unless they change the formula, which they do from time to time. Uh, but you're not going to know about that unless you check regularly. Uh, a rainstorm certainly isn't going to have any impact on it. And if you've got well water, then a rainstorm doesn't – that's not how groundwater works. You, you ain't pumping water six inches below the surface. Uh, it takes months and months, years for a rain to finally get down into the aquifer – uh, whatever soaks into the ground. Now, if you've got um, an artesian well where you actually are taking surface water, all right, but the number of people out there that have artesian wells, especially in this day and age, um, and I gotta sell my parents now. Um, nobody has artesian wells anymore. The, the people across the street used to, but when they sold their house, well, not the people across the street or the people before them, the people before them, when we moved in, um, they had an artesian well and before when they sold the house uh they had to change it they had to, to, to install a regular ground well because nobody would buy it uh with the artesian well now i'll grant you that house has a hill behind the property and at the top of the hill is a trash and refuse recycling uh place where there's garbage trucks and fuel tanks and you know mechanics garages and everything right at the top of the hill uh, they do test regularly and they check the groundwater around here to make sure they're not polluting and everything. And it always comes out negative, or at least they say it does. Um, but I wouldn't drink out of surface groundwater right there below them and everything. And so I, I don't blame anybody else for not doing it either. But rain, rain isn't going to do that. Now, my water will change over the course of the year, but it's a gradual change. It's seasonal. It has more to do with uh, like spring fertilizing, and then slowly that that fertilizer will make its way into the the ground. So maybe by midsummer, I might have slightly higher nitrate levels in my groundwater. Um, but even then, it's not much of a fluctuation. And again, a rainstorm certainly isn't going to to do that. <clears throat> Yeah, we've got, I've got anywhere from 20 to 50 parts per million. Sometimes that valve comes out almost red. I can go do a sample. I'll tell you what's in my uh, water right now. Fish don't need oxygen. They breathe the water. That's a good point, Ark. I didn't even think about that. All right, I'll do another dab here in a second. Never trust the water near Mexico. I don't blame you there either. Oh, that's interesting, uh, Christopher. Drink natural spring. <laughs> Kind of good. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Hey, Hessel, how are you? Did you uh, change your time or did you not change your time? And then since I changed my time, it's earlier for you. Wow, you're, you're what, six hours ahead of me then? I know uh, England, you know, all straight up and down. Uh, the, the whole entire UK, in fact, is uh, five hours ahead of me. I'm uh, GMT plus five so <clears throat> you're minus one all right we are going to do another dab and it is going to be once again out of my actually you know what let's do something different i need to run to the little fish keeper's room and while i'm doing that i'm going to first throw some algae wafers in the discus tank for you so you can all Enjoy Discus Fight Club as they all fight over their discus wafers. 
algae wafers because they do love them some algae wafers. Uh, I'm going to go talk to a man about a horse. And then when I come back, we are going to hit on Glamdring, the weed hammer, my big ass bong. So I got some weed in the other room. It's not very good, but it'll be something to talk about, first of all. And it'll be something to hit on, secondly. Um, I just put this in the jar. It's not even fully dry. This is what was hanging up the other night. So that's what I got off of that one plant. So that's not cured yet. And that's not even fully dry. Like I said, I still got the jar open because we're letting that dry out a little bit. Um, my other jar of Hawaiian puff is actually starting to wake up a little bit. This has been, if you've ever cured weed, when you first put it in, it smells nice and, you know, fragrant and delicious. And then it goes through about a week period where the, the, it just smells like kind of nothing. It just smells like sort of plant material. You know, it could be just random leaves in a jar. And then after 10 days or so, that flavor, you know, just starts waking up and coming back. Um, and by about week three, it just blossoms and you've got this amazing, amazing smell and flavor and everything. The curing process really is where the magic happens. And so we're just at the point where it's starting to wake up a little bit. So not fully cured, but it'll be something to puff on and it'll give me an excuse to hit on glam drink, the weed hammer. So let me go do this and then I will come and do that. All right, I'm back. Um, uh, before I forget, let me go grab this real quick. Are you still with us, Sir Gabriel? I got all these uh, cheapy little blurple lights that I told you I was going to give you. Uh, this one is not one of them. Uh, those are all low wattage, and I figure since you're going to be operating off of like a budget anyway, a little extra blue and green light ain't going to hurt you. But I do have this... Mars Hydro unit, if you will remember, this is the one that stopped working properly. And one side of the panels, I don't know which one it is, but one side of the panels is not working. Now, presumably, uh, one of the drivers has gone bad. I don't know which one, but one each driver can, can take, you know, does two panels. There's two boards on each side. So when you plug it in and you work it, you only get two panels lit, but two panels still work. Uh, it doesn't work for my tent, but if you've got nothing, this would still give you two panels. You know, you could put two small plants underneath the one half of this and you'd still get, you know, good light. So if you want this, Gabriel, you can have this too. Uh, this is going to be a little more pricey on the shipping though. This would probably be 20 bucks or something on shipping. Uh, but if you want that, that's a genuine grow light. It's just only half of it works. So you let me know if you want that, uh, and I will get that shipped off to you as well. But I'll ship the, uh, the other stuff to you, uh, no charge. I'll just donate that to the cause. Um, that's okay, little man. I see you, little guy. So this is the other panels that I'm talking about. I think I showed you guys these the other day. These are like 15. No, I think these are 45 watts. These actually are a little bit higher wattage. I have another one that's like 15 watts, but I have two like this. Uh, they're very thin, very lightweight. Just a piece of aluminum on the back. That's the heat sink. Um, it's just blue and, and red. There's no white lights or anything on there. So I got three of these types of panels. Um, and again, I'll just ship them out to you. Uh, no, you know, I'll, I'll cover the charge on that. But if you want that big, heavy one, uh, we're going to have to work out something on the shipping or something, <laughs> but you'll still get a good, um, you know, 
two boards out of that for whatever the shipping costs, 20 bucks. <laughs> I don't know what else to do with it. I don't want to just straight up throw it away, you know, but I was going to see if Mike wanted it. I don't know how well you can see that or not. It smells really good, especially now that I'm handling it and bruising it a little bit. So I don't know how well that's turning out, but that's my own little homegrown nug. I'm finally getting back to where my stuff is starting to be decent again. <laughs> it took me a year to figure that shit out, and it was just a tiny, tiny, tiny little adjustment I had to make to my pH. I'm still doing that. I'm still pumping the tiniest little bit of acid into the water to bring the pH down the teeniest little bit, and my plants are lush and green and growing and that's all it was. That's all I had to do was just bump that pH down a tiniest little bit. It took me a year to figure that out. <laughs> but we got there in the end. So, yay. <clears throat> all right. We're going to see if we can do all this in one hit. Again, I didn't put any ice in this, so that's a big lot of air to take in at first, and it kind of makes it difficult to do solid hits out of this bong. It's Again, I call these like college party boy bongs. They're a little too big to be practical. That's the size bong you want if you want to do good, practical, huge bong hits. You need something that's reasonable. This is impressive to look at and fun to play with, but it just, I don't know. It's hard to get a really good, solid hit off of it. <laughs> now, you fill it with ice, and that's a different story. It hits really nicely when it's got ice in it. I just don't feel like getting ice and putting it in it. <clears throat> We did okay. And I killed it all in the first hit. That second hit was about nothing. <coughs> ah, there we go. <clears throat> That's what I was waiting to move out of there. Nope. Hang on. <coughs> There we go. Me, me, me. Now we can do a bong hit. Oh, I've still got my bowl full of... That's got hash oil drizzled all over it. So let's do a hit off of this. Definitely a big difference doing a hit off of a bowl than it is doing a hit off of this. <coughs> Definitely does not go down as smooth. <coughs> That's for sure. Uh, yes, eyeball acid. Not sure what kind of acid it is. Um, phosphoric acid. St. Mary's County, and they go up to Silver Spring. You hate that drive. <laughs> well, St. Mary's County is way down on the eastern shore, so that's uh, like a three-hour drive from me. And then uh, even going to Silver Spring, you're just going to come straight in uh, 50 probably, I'm assuming, and you're going to go all the way around to like 495 and then go up around 495 to Silver Spring. That's how I would do it if I was you. <laughs> <coughs> My next door neighbor's uh, 64. Now, he doesn't smoke the way I do, but he smokes. Well, I've seen the video of the guy washing his hands in the pee trough. Is it where he keeps picking up the, uh, the, the, the toilet mint thing and trying to use it like a bar of soap? Is that what you're talking about? Is it a weird one where it's a female reporter that's like in the men's room? Is that the one you're talking about there, Laura? Because I've seen that video. Uh, absolute doink. Uh, hello, by the way. No, I've never tried growing out of an aquarium. I get asked that a lot. Uh, surprisingly. Johnsta, how are you? Oh, right. I didn't even think about that. I'm sorry, eyeball. I should have done this a while ago. My pardon. Let's do something a little fancier than that. All right, let's, that sounds, that looks fancy enough. 
There you go. Woohoo! Party, party, everybody. There's my disco lights. <laughs> I really do need to get a disco ball down here. 66. See, there you go, Shamu. <laughs> nice, Cecil. Yeah, you could probably actually just replace one of those drivers. Wouldn't even have to repair it. Just put a new driver on it. It'll probably work just fine. Uh, Christopher, those little panels, you can, if you're looking for something like that, um, first of all, I wouldn't recommend getting something like that, but you can get them really cheap on Amazon. If that's all you want is one of those little, uh, blurple panels. The only reason I'm giving them to Gabriel is because it's better than nothing. You know, I used to have them as sort of supplemental red and blue light when I was growing under fluorescence. And I just figured it's giving me some extra red and blue on top of these weak ass fluorescents. Now that I got these, um, you know, modern LEDs, you know, uh, my 110, I even have the new mint white Evo LEDs in that one. And so I just don't need these little low wattage secondary sort of light sources, you know, but I figured Gabriel might be able to get some use out of them. And I am always willing to help a brother in need. Three gallon fish tank with duckweed. Nice. <laughs> Big ass bong is a perfect size. Perfect for what? No, not that kind of acid uh, eyeball. <laughs> that, that would be awesome if I put a little drop of acid in every one of my every one of my plants when I'm watering it. <clears throat> yeah, that's what I thought you were talking about, Laura. I just, there, there's so many things about that video that just make me like, what the fuck? What, what am I watching here? God, I hate the world. Uh, I do not sell fish, Amy. Well, that is true. Big ass is my favorite size, Shamu. <laughs> so on that note, I will do another hit out of my big ass bong. This even feels almost a little, a little too moist. Because it might have like 30% moisture still left in it. I was thinking about that this evening too. If you're a new grower or amateur starting out and you're trying to like dry your weed properly and all that, the reason I took it down from hanging and put it in that jar before it's fully dry is because it, first of all, was drying too quickly. And when you'd first touch it, it would feel sort of dry and crusty. But if you squeezed a little more, you realize the inside was still moist. So that's, it's losing moisture on the outside faster than the moisture from the inside can sort of migrate out. You want that to be a nice even process. So by putting it after it's mostly dry into that jar, but leaving the lid off, I put it somewhere where there's air movement and that will allow basically by the wick effect, that moisture will be able to make its way through that weed and kind of evaporate out of the jar. And over the next couple of days, it'll be dry enough that I'll be able to sort of just put the lid on and open it once a day, make sure everything's okay. And as long as it's been, you know, 24, 48 hours and I open the lid and it hasn't like sort of gotten moist again, because that's what will happen. It'll feel dry and you'll close the lid and you'll come back the next day and it'll feel moist again because that moisture that was still way inside was still working its way out. So you've got to keep burping it every day and making sure you, you're getting excess moisture out of there. Once it's dry to where you're dry enough and you can just close it, you'll be below the point where mold, mildew or anything like that can grow in there. You'd be about 23 to 25% moisture at that point. And I was thinking how you would know where to do that if you didn't have experience doing it and you can weigh it. You want it about 25, between 20 and 25% moisture before you really close it up and leave it closed. So go by weight. If you start with 10 grams freshly cut, don't wait overnight. It'll lose a lot of moisture overnight, believe it or not. But if you take 10 grams freshly cut, once that's properly dried, it's going to be about two and a half grams. It's, you're going to lose about 75% of the weight in moisture. Uh, and then you're once you get it down to that weight, you're at the right moisture level. And eventually you'll be able to tell just, I mean, if you're 
familiar with smoking weed, you should know it should be soft, but not moist. It shouldn't be crumbly, but it should be dry enough that it can break. If you, you know, you want to break a little piece of the butt off, the stem should break rather than bend. If the stem still bends, then it's too moist. Um, you get the idea. Uh, but you, but you want to lose about 75% of the weight in just water when you're drying it out. It's, a, it's amazing how much water, you know, weed is. Well, just like us, we're 75% water. That's hard to believe too, isn't it? Mm. So if I got all the water out of my body, I'd weigh about 50 pounds. <laughs> I probably wouldn't look very good though. <clears throat> I think we got all that. <coughs> all right. Look like a mummy. Those lights are worse for the fish than the nitrates. <laughs> Uh, I would say no chance though. The bristle knows are not going to eat the leaves. They might damage them as they're scraping, but I, they won't eat the leaves themselves, but they might scrape the surface of them a little and do some damage, but it would be minor damage. I wouldn't worry about it. Yeah, exactly. Christopher, I don't know if you were listening to me talking about it earlier, but back in the day, <clears throat> You, you didn't get a full spectrum light, really. You, you, you had to do, you know, make the best of what you could in the vegging area. You would use the metal halide because they were that nice bright blue and all that. Um, if you're not familiar with the difference, think of metal halide. Think of when you go into the Home Depot or something and you look up and you see those great big glass glowing, you know, that's, that's a bright, bright white light. That's metal halide. Uh, the old school street lights that would come on and would like start glowing sort of pale orange and, and, and just slowly get brighter and brighter and would still give you that nice soft light that almost looks like an incandescent bulb. That's high pressure sodium. And so the high pressure sodium just gives you a lot more red light and the metal halide gives you that more bright white blue light. And so for vegging, you would use that. And again, these, you know, Huge amount of electricity again, thousand watt light. I don't, I use uh, all three of my flowering tents plus my vegging area is just over a thousand watts combined. Um, back in the day, a well, 1000 watt high pressure sodium light would, would be over maybe two plants, and you'd be using a thousand watts over a couple of plants. Uh, if you did a room, you'd have four or five of those big thousand watt lights. You'd have four or 5,000 watts of light over half a dozen plants or something in the middle of the room back in the day. That's why people would use fluorescence. You know, not everybody could use the, the fixtures were expensive. They used a shit ton of electricity and each light produced about as much heat as a campfire. So you had to put air conditioning in and regulate the heat and all that kind of stuff. And so back in the day shit was complicated nowadays you can spend 150 bucks on a nice little cool ass led panel buy a tent for 100 bucks and you're growing you know it's awesome you can buy everything you need on amazon and have it in the mail tomorrow yeah you said moist remember to burp them jars exactly and you don't you don't really have to deal with the heat with the with my tents in the winter time, the heat is fine. It doesn't get warm at all. And in the summertime, since I ventilate, um, you know, I have a fan pulling air out the top just to keep fresh air moving in the bottom. So we keep plenty of CO2 circulating through there. That alone keeps the tent plenty cool enough. I don't have any special cooling apparatus or anything like that for my tents. I'm sh shedding watchers. <laughs> What's the other one that everybody hates? Suck, I think, is the other word everybody hates to hear. Moist <laughs> and suck. One of the uh, one of my favorite Terry Pratchett books. One of the, the characters' name is Moist. 
I'm going to say that so many times tonight now. M. Myers, how are you doing? Or is it Myers? I'm sorry. From Belgium. Got another one from Belgium. Welcome aboard. I have a regular viewer that's from Belgium. Uh, this guy right here that you're talking about is a Tenopoma acuterostra. Sold locally as an African spotted leaf fish, but it's not actually a leaf fish. It's a uh, anabantoid. It's related to a gourami. In fact, it's called a leopard gourami sometimes or a spotted uh, bush gourami. It's got a lot of names, but it is a tenopoma spelled with a C, acuterostra. Oh, there you go, Christopher. Interesting. I didn't know you needed different ballast for the different kind of bulbs, but that makes sense. What does salt do in your fish tank? Uh, the main thing salt does in your fish tank is provide sodium uh, for your... Thank you, Shamu. Uh, it provides sodium for your fish. So your fish has to use energy to extract sodium out of the water through its gills. Uh, most of our water doesn't have a whole lot of sodium in it. And so when they say, if you've got a sick fish, you should put some salt in the water or whatever. Uh, the first thing that happens when salt dissolves into the water is the sodium and the chloride separate. And so you have free sodium in the water and it simply makes it easier for the fish to absorb it. And therefore it doesn't have to expend energy extracting sodium out of the water that it could use that energy otherwise in helping deal with whatever illness or immune issue it's having uh, or whatever. So a little bit of salt in the water uh, is helpful and you can use pink Himalayan salt, table salt, aquarium salt. I use table salt. Are you doing this shit again, you weird ass fish? He went all the way across the whole surface of the water, like in a nose up like a wheelie uh, with his face up out of the water this time. The other night he was doing corkscrews. Maybe he's a stunt fish. Maybe he's practicing. I wonder if he's got a gig coming up. Back in my day, stole the football stadium lights. <laughs> That's awesome. That makes me think of the scene in the Blues Brothers where they stole that big ass speaker off that pole at the at the, uh, at the uh, lake. 1.21 gigawatts. It's, uh, is it gigawatts or gigawatts? Was it gigawatts? I think it might have been gigawatts. Who knows? 10,000 watts on tracks that moved. Yep. Oh, that would have been interesting, um, Christopher. Do you know who, um, oh, God, what's his name now? Dr. Bruce Bugsby? Yeah, do you know who Dr. Bruce Bugsby is, Christopher? Uh, Chonsta, you probably will use uh, lose your neons to your angelfish. Yeah, this is probably one of the biggest ones you'll see. He's thicker in the middle now than he was long when I got him. And he's already several years past his uh, sell-by date that comes on the box. I think they say they live seven years or eight years or something like that. And this one's at least, um, he's at least 10, maybe a little older than 10 by now. <laughs> moist is your favorite word. Moist. Yeah, but an angelfish's mouth, when they get full grown, see, it's hit or miss. If they grow up together, they might be okay because the angelfish may not recognize them as food. Um, if you've got full grown neons already and you put a small angelfish in the tank and the angelfish grows up around full grown neons, that may be okay. But if you've got a full grown angelfish and you introduce small neons into your tank, they are fish food. They're gone. Um 
that predatory instinct. I don't care how many hundreds of bajillions of generations they've been bred in captivity, that predatory instinct will kick in and they will eat the shit out of your neons if you put uh, any kind of small fish in the tank, really. And remember, angelfish get bigger than you think in a lot of cases and ones that get uh, fairly large. I've had some pretty large angelfish over the years. Their mouths open up bigger than you think and they can eat fish bigger than you think. Even guppies uh, in a lot of cases might not be safe with a large angelfish. So uh, remember that they will eat smaller fish. Uh, salt can definitely hurt your plants. And salt can help with certain kinds of bacterial infections, fungal infections. Um, some, some of the uh, different organisms don't do well in salt water or saltier water. I've heard that ick doesn't do well in salt or saltier water. So if you're treating for ick and you add salt, that sort of helps fight it back. Although I don't, if you're putting medication in the tank, then the salt's not necessary for that. But again, the salt will help your fish just be less stressed out. It'll help its uh, health conditions by having some extra salt in the water, but it can harm your plants. If you got some plants, it can be really sensitive to salt. Um, usually though, the amounts of salt we're talking about uh, maxes out at about a teaspoon per gallon of water. You don't really want to go more than that. And just about all fish that I know of can handle that without uh, much issue. Oh, thanks, Harley. I like them too. I forgot to turn them on tonight. I came in uh, last minute because once again, I was listening to my ballet. Let me see if I can get myself interested in ballet. You know, when I looked up like popular ballets to see what, you know, was available for me to choose from, I was surprised at how few ballets there were. There's like 15 of them that are listed as like popular ballets. And Again, I recognized a few of the names that, you know, I couldn't bring to my mind because yeah, all I could think of was the couple that I know. Um, but a lot of them, I didn't even recognize the names of them or whatever. I was like, oh, you know, <laughs> like, so like I said, I'm not a ballet guy. I'm not really an opera guy either, but I do like opera and I do listen to opera. Um, so I would definitely consider myself more of an opera guy than a ballet guy. Oh, you met Bruce. Okay. Yeah, that's what I was getting ready to say. If you know who Bruce Bugsby is, I've never experienced anybody who no, understands fucking light like that guy does. I love that guy. He dispelled the bullshit about how plants only use red and blue light. That was the belief for years in, in the hobby and the industry. That was the belief that plants only need red and blue light. And that was all based on one bullshit experiment that was done with very questionable methodology. Another thing, if you ever do sciencey stuff, look at the methodology, look at the way, you know, look at the test study size, you know, look at the sample size, look at the whether, you know, the, the quality, whether they do a control or not. You got to look at all that kind of stuff. And the, 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 the experiment that was done that determined that plants only use red and blue light and they don't use green light or whatever. It was such a bullshit experiment. Um, and then the simple stands to reason logic, which you just can't rely on. I know there's a lot of things out there that seem like they'd be this way, or it stands to reason they'd be that way, or somebody said something and makes sense to you. Doesn't mean it's true. <laughs> um, and, and so the, the, the going idea was that, well, plants are green. If we're seeing green, that means it's reflecting the green light off of them, and therefore it's not using the green light. But when you shine those blurple, you know, the blue and the red only, the plants just look black, and that's because they're soaking all that blue and that green in. That's all true, except for the part where the plants aren't using green light. Just because they're reflecting some green light doesn't mean they're not using any green light. The sun puts out more green light than it puts out all the other colors combined. It puts out so much green light, and it's a wide band of green light. Look, think of all the different shades of green when you're looking at all the different kind of plants. So clearly, they're all absorbing different wavelengths of green and reflecting other wavelengths of green and varying combinations thereof. Uh, red plants clearly are not reflecting a whole lot of green off of them, and there's a lot of red plants. Again, the idea that plants 
would not use the most abundant energetic i mean just not using green light is is insane like why why would the plants not evolve to use green light that maybe just it doesn't make any sense and so i watched the whole video again um it's the migro channel uh does lighting but he also has Bruce uh, Bugsby on there from time to time as a guest. And he does like these hour long videos where they just discuss light and lighting and horticulture or whatever, really interesting stuff. Um, and I could go on at length about the green light and penetration of the canopy and all that kind of stuff. Um, Cause it's fascinating it, the way green light and plants interact and everything. It's, it's plants have evolved to use green light in really interesting ways and for so many years people didn't think they used it at all and yet they do all kinds of stuff with green light it's amazing so yeah that must have been uh interesting meeting him and talking to him and whatnot <clears throat> All right, blue zebra angel likes to bite your finger. Good grief. And Shamu has gigantic hands, everybody. Uh, let's see. Now, he is um, at the Department of Horticulture at University of Colorado, I want to say. Somewhere out there. He's still going. He does the uh, interviews and stuff with uh, the Migro YouTube channel. Uh, Archer fish are really cool. And if you've got a setup where you could have an Archer fish, Jay, that would be awesome. But they need big tanks. They need open area. You need, you know, to be willing to have them spitting water out of the tank. Uh, you would need to be having bugs, you know, hanging above them and all that. But they're neat. <laughs> uh, salt may help slow them down. I don't know necessarily think that's the way I would approach it, though. Uh, Art. I have no idea how many chips are running through that. Um, Russell. It definitely doesn't have 555. It's a 50-foot long string. I have it wrapped around there uh, twice, but I have it woven. So when I wrapped it, it went around three times. When I wove it, it went around twice. Oh, that's a bummer, Mike. Soggy Toast, how are you doing? Well, you're going to have to feed the fish just because the fish need to be fed. You can feed them a little bit every other day while you're still making sure the cycle is working. You don't want to put a whole lot of food in there and put a lot of bio load in it if the cycle's not working most of the time. Those instant cycles don't work, uh, at least not instantly. You can rapidly cycle a tank, and there's ways to do that. Uh, but the only way to truly instantly cycle a tank is to take a pre-cycled filter whether it's a sponge filter, hang on the back, whatever. If you've got a pre-cycled filter that's on a functioning existing cycled tank, move the whole filter over and then you will have a pre-cycled tank. But even then, it's bare minimum of cycled because the only truly cycled part of that tank is going to be the bio filtration and whatnot that's going on in the filter. You're not going to have any kind of biofiltration inherent within the tank itself. That's going to take time uh, to build up. Uh, as far as like pouring those bottles of stuff in there and all that, I've heard mixed stories. My personal experience was it didn't do shit. Um, I've heard everything from didn't do shit to an hour later it was working. I don't necessarily believe that, but I've been told that. Um, so I don't know. Check, 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 test, test, make sure it's working. Uh, don't just take their word for it on the bottle that if you pour this in, everything will be fine. Uh, again, that instant cycle doesn't necessarily always work. All right, let me see where we are. Uh, 
There you go, Christopher. I'm glad you feel at home here. No, uh, your angel fish will definitely eat them, Shamu. What are you doing, little man? I'm surprised Squeaker hasn't come in and harassed us yet tonight. Uh, I think betas are okay with a little bit of salt, Shamu. Um, oh, I'm always going to buy new fish at some point, Annie. If I can get a stop sign from somebody, I would appreciate it. Uh, I just, I don't know when I'm going to get any new fish. I was actually thinking about that the other day. I was kind of looking around my tanks and wondering if any of them are really missing any fish. Uh, we are still going to break that in half again. I'm trying not to do gigantic hits that make me choke and cough, but I appreciate the fact that this is supposed to be a weed smoking live stream. And so using my big ass bong is just more fun than doing this is my preferred way of smoking it just really is uh heating that straw up and just doing a giant hit of my hash oil uh smoking actual bud is my least favorite way of doing it. i feel like a fucking barbarian setting fire to the shit and burning it up do you appreciate a fine beautiful orchid by burning it no you don't fucking barbarian behavior all right everybody cheers <clears throat> hang on let me clear out some space <laughs> me, me, me. Oh, that was perfect. Cleared it, cleared it, and just filled my lungs up because it ain't a proper bong hit if you got space left over when you're done inhaling. <laughs> You got to take it to the limit every time. Well, I don't always. I'm just talking shit. Um, I actually do more reasonable size bong hits quite often because I can do several smaller ones in a row. But there is something to be said. Uh, Shamu and I were talking about that uh, a week or two ago about the difference between doing, you know, you can smoke the same amount of weed, but doing it in one giant bong hit versus several smaller bong hits. The one giant bong hit just beats beats the smaller ones every time. It always does. I don't know why. <coughs> Oh, a 10 gallon? No, 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 John. So I've had single pads that would take up the entire surface of a 10 gallon. Mine's in a 125. I've got one that's not doing well in my pond here in the room. And I've got one in my 40, which is, uh, it's pretty crowded being in the 40, but a 10 gallon tank, I mean, it's just, they get big. They get really big. Um, I've seen them in tanks where the, the runners that go all the way up to where the actual pad is have been seven or eight feet long. Uh, they, they can get really, really big. And of course I've seen them out in the ponds, you know, in the reservoir and stuff like that, where you get pads that are three feet in diameter and these, these runners that are six, eight, 10 feet long in the water. So li lilies get pretty big. Um, it's just not something you'd really be able to do in a 10 gallon tank. I'm afraid. Oh, uh, that's a bummer there, Russell. Why are you giving up smoking? <laughs> what was that chant? I just said, me, me, me. I just did it in a nice deep voice so I could make sure uh, that's how I know I can, my throat's nice and clear. If it's a scratchy and, you know, you can hear the gurgling and stuff, I'm not ready. Smoking a joint. Nice. a <laughs> hundred dollars to go buy some i would definitely go buy some if you sent me money to do it platinum og bud nice white widow oh hang on everybody i'll show you something oh you can I'll take that as a stop sign right there uh laura because i'm gonna be right back But I bought a whole bunch of seeds a long time ago. I have like a seed bank in the other room. And it was while I was still struggling to figure out what was going on. So I have yet to grow any of the seeds I've gotten. But both of these are White Widow. And look at them. I got this little one here. Yay. And I got that one there. Yay. 
So we are underway. Got some white widows coming. So I got a couple of white widows that have sprouted. I'm waiting on a couple of Tropicana cookies. The seeds have cracked. I've put the seeds in the soil, but they just have not broken the soil yet. And this one, if you look, you can, well, I think you can kind of tell. Now you got the light on the wrong side. If we put the light behind it, you can see one of these has actually cracked and has a little tail starting to stick off of it. So tomorrow uh, we'll put that one in some soil too. And that's also, both of those are also Tropicana cookies. So I've got them. I've got a Blue Dream seed that has come up recently. And I have some Super Silver Haze seeds that are pretty close to going into the flowering tent. And Super Silver Haze is another one that I got the seeds and I haven't actually had any of the Super Silver Haze since I bought it. Um, my two mainstays are the Hawaiian Puff and the Wicked Space. Uh, I don't have any seeds of those, so I've been cloning them for years. But Hawaiian Puff is amazing. It's my favorite weed. And Wicked Space is pretty damn good, too. And the thing is, they're both easy to propagate. Wicked Space is very easy to propagate. Hawaiian Puff's a little tougher, but they're both pretty easy. If I get a plant that I don't care for all that much and it's really easy to propagate, I might make a few extra plants just to sort of get my money's worth out of it, but I'll let that die off if I'm not a big fan of it. If I get a plant that's really difficult to make cuttings of and it's just really tough to propagate, I generally don't worry about that either because it's just a pain in my ass and I don't like stressing out about it. So that combination of a plant I really like and I make three or four cuttings and two or three of them root, one of them dies off, that's the plant for me, you know? Mm -hmm. And the Hawaiian Puff and the Wicked Space are both like that. If I make five or six cuttings, a pretty good chance that at least two or three of those are going to root in and start growing and I just keep them going. And so the Hawaiian Puff and Wicked Space, I have literally been growing those two plants for 10 years or something from the original seeds I got. Um, everything else I actually have seeds of and I don't have to make cuttings of. <clears throat> All right, something about just plain vanilla. I must have missed something. Let me find that stop sign again. There it is. Oh, let's see. Digging out some ice cream. Nice. Girl Scout cookies. I thought Girl Scout cookies uh, changed their name because they got sued. <laughs> oh, you have serious lung problems. I got you. That's a, that's a good reason to quit. Can you do edibles? I don't like edibles, though. That would suck if I had to be stuck on edibles. Rocky Road. Thank you, Russell. Switch to edibles. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I don't like the edibles, though. Oh, spontaneous double lung collapse. What the fuck? No, oh, that would suck, Shane. I mean, you're getting a bunch of damn females when you order all the thinking you're getting all that color. Real marshmallows. I'm not a big Rocky Road fan. First surgery failed four days in the hospital. Man. Oh, that would so suck having to get a lung removed. I'm telling you, the old saying is true. If we all threw our tables, you know, we all threw our problems out on the table. You'd be scrambling to get your own right back. <laughs> I know I would when I hear about other people's issues. I'm a plain vanilla guy myself. I like vanilla. And I don't know why everybody acts like it's plain. Vanilla has over 400 different flavor compounds in it. Vanilla is amazing. Yeah, exactly. I complain about the pains and kinks I get in my neck there, Shirley. Chocolate ice cream's all right. I'm a vanilla guy, though. Four months in the hospital. God, that sucks. I'm glad you made it out. You know what I really like, Tom? We have a creamery in town, and I get their vanilla, and I get their homemade vanilla, 
uh, and then I get their orange sherbet and mix them together to make like the orange dream, or they make a raspberry sherbet and the raspberry sherbet and vanilla ice cream is even better. It's so good, but they only do the raspberry, uh, every once in a while. They do the orange all the time. In fact, I was looking, we still have an orange, uh, a pint of orange sherbet and a pint of vanilla ice cream that has to have been in there since last summer. Um, I'm probably going to throw it away. Um, I'm going to guess that it's a little freezer burned by now. <laughs> gas, it smells like weed. I wish my gas smelled like weed. <laughs> All right, Amy, I hopefully we'll see you uh, on Wednesday. That's true. Ice cream is ice cream. Oh, dude, everybody, when they first discover Sh uh, Shamu, when they, yeah, well, when they first discover Shamu, too, they won't stop talking about him. Uh, everybody uh, rants and raves about Congo Tetras when they first discover them because you hear Tetra and you just, yeah, what Congo Tetras are some dank fish. I mean, they are awesome. Well, I don't know if they're dank or not. I haven't smoked one yet. Yet. I'm not a fan of edibles. I've never had sorbet, but I bet I would like it. Nice, TK. Salad on the vanilla. Vanilla is not white. See, I'm not a butter pecan person because I don't like the pecan. I don't like mint chocolate chip, but chocolate chip is actually my favorite ice cream uh, flavor. And I also like butter brickle, but butter brickle is really sweet and it's very uncommon. Most people uh, don't carry butter brickle. Delta nine edibles for two months. There's nothing wrong with that, except, to, you know, if you're like me, if you don't like edibles, <laughs> biscuits and taters, that sounds good. Oh, an orange frosty. That sounds interesting. I do like a frosty every once in a while. All uh, right. Peanut butter chocolate shake. <laughs> Diabetes. <laughs> you a big uh, Wilford Brimley fan there, Mike? <laughs> <clears throat> All right, Fish Hippie, that sounds like a good evening to me. I wish my ass was sleeping in my uh, uh, recliner this whole time. I not, don't mean that, of course. <laughs> no, that's funny, Mike. Just by the way you spelled that, I knew what you meant. Uh, did you have real, like, uh, organic peanut butter, Russell? Because if you did and, and you had, like, the all-natural stuff, I'm right there with you. Like, fuck that stuff. Uh, if you have, like, Jif or Peter Pan or processed peanut butter that's all smooth and it's got um, hydrogenated oil in it and it's got sugar added, that's what most people eat when they think of peanut butter. The stuff that's the organic stuff that's basically just – literally peanuts that have been mashed until they're smooth and creamy. Um, that's not good. That, 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 I know that sounds good. It, it sounds really good, that, but it's just, it's not good. And the oil separates and you got to mix it all together and you wear your damn arm out, mixing that oil back in to get it smooth and creamy again. And then there's no salt in it and there's no sugar in it. And it's just, it's not, again, like you said, dries your mouth out, but the, the regular stuff shouldn't do that. Peanut butter and chocolate go together like peaches and cream. No, you got your chocolate and my peanut butter. I know how this goes. All 
That's interesting though, Russell. We were just talking about food and the difference between the English food and the American food uh, the other night. Yeah, you've said that about the pineapple and pizza before. I personally don't give a shit what people like. If they think pineapple and pizza tastes good, I don't give a shit. Um, I think black olives are just disgusting, but people put black olives on pizza, so if that's what you're into. That's fucking none of my business. Do what you want. <clears throat> Soy peanut butter. <laughs> Yeah, well, if you can't have, if you got, you know, allergies, peanuts are usually a bad one. Yeah, if you've got to mix the oil back in, then you got the shitty stuff there, Russell. You should open it up. It should be nice and soft and smooth and creamy. Even if it's got the crunchy bits in it, the, the peanut butter itself should just be smooth and creamy. If it's really thick and stiff and you got to mix the oil in and stuff, that's the gross stuff. You don't want to eat that. Uh, dude, I still to this day, Mike, I think every time I walk past somebody or I walk behind somebody in the Walmart, I think, oh, God, did I used to smell like that? Was I that gross? Because, you know, it's been years since I smoked. But, God, I smoked Reds, you know, Marlboro Reds for a long time, way too long. Um, and I, I must have smelled like that because I, I was a smoker, you know. I tried to be good about not having the smoke just on me. I rolled my window down when I was driving. Um, I remember my dad, when I was a kid, he would just hold his fingers like this with like the cigarette facing down as he sat in his chair and the smoke would just rise up around his fingers or whatever. And his fingers were stained yellow all around his first two knuckles from where the cigarette smoke would just on his fingers all the time. I always avoided stuff like that. When I drove, I would keep the cigarette near the window. So the smoke would just go out. Um, you know, I'd blow my you know, hits out the window as best I could, but I was a smoker. You can't not get the smell on you, you know? And even when I did massage and I was at massage school, I would go outside on break and I'd smoke a couple cigarettes real quick. And then I'd go back inside and do a massage on somebody. Uh, I had to have just reeked of, of cigarettes while I'm leaning over working on somebody. It must've been gross. And of course I reeked like fucking vodka because I was a drunk at the time too. So imagine that getting a massage by somebody that smelled like cigarettes and vodka. <laughs> <laughs> that was, must have been a, quite a treat. Half yeah, with pineapple, have with black olives. <laughs> you should mix the black olives and pineapples together and let them fight. It does stink, Gabriel. Dude, I had an uncle that had uh, part of his throat removed from cancer in his throat, and he went back to smoking as soon as he healed up. Camel wines. No, oh, I bet they were, Mike. Camel wines. I don't know what I smoked if I couldn't get Marlboros. I don't even remember. <laughs> See, that's logic there, uh, Shirley. Yeah. So that's I don't give people grief. I really don't. Whether you still smoke, first of all, none of my business. I'm not, you know, ain't my job to fucking tell you to stop doing something you do. Um, and secondly, I just, I know how hard it is to quit. When I quit, remember, if you're not familiar and you don't know my circumstances, I quit because I was on death's doorstep from drinking myself to death. And I spent two weeks in the hospital under medical supervision where I was given uh, Librium on a controlled basis to bring me down through the alcohol withdrawal, uh, which was amazing. If you ever do have to, to go through alcohol withdrawal, do it under medical supervision. I've done it both ways. I've done it cold Turkey. It was the most hellish nightmare that I can't believe I even lived through it. Uh, and I've done it 
medically supervised and it was the fucking way to go. It was just smooth as butter. And I was given nicotine patches and consecutively reduced doses again, under controlled circumstances, whether, you know, they, they came and changed them by prescription, whether I asked for them or not, they just did that for me. And by the time I got out of the hospital, I hadn't smoked in over two weeks. And I just said, why, why go back to doing it? You know, I don't want a cigarette and I'm just, you know, I'd quit drinking. I'd send, and that was it. Since then I've not smoked or had a, a sip of alcohol. And that has been 13 years ago or, or something like that. Let's see. God, I don't even know when it was. I want to say 2012 or something. I know I was still drinking when my dad died and that was in 2011 but I must have gotten clean shortly after that because I was on death's door when he died. Uh, I was already in rough shape. So probably the following summer uh, or something, 2012 is the last time I had a drink or a cigarette. And um, I don't miss him. <laughs> Best thing I ever did. I don't miss him. Either one. But I love me my weed. Yeah, nicotine is, is very addictive. I wish I could have just quit drinking. Two melons. I don't know about that, Russell. I, I haven't heard that. Yeah, the nicotine patch helped chewing the gum. You know, once I got out of the hospital, I chewed the gum for a couple of weeks. Uh, when I was really having a craving for nicotine, I would put some gum, you know, do the gum thing just to get the nicotine out of, craving out of my system. Yeah, exactly, Mike. That was the same thing with me. Nicotine patches full of nitrate. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I won't say never either. I don't take anything for granted anymore. I'm just saying I haven't drank in that long behind me. I don't know how far ahead of me I've got to go. I would love it to be the rest of my life, and I'd love that to be many, many years away. But... I can't swear to that. I don't know. I do not know what the future holds for me. So I, you know, I'll worry about that when I get there. But for now, I can say it's been a good run so far. Uh, and hopefully we're going to keep up the uh, trend. <clears throat> now, I remember what I wanted to say before I get out of here. Um, I think my wife has a bottle of vodka somewhere in the house that's sort of out of sight, out of mind, so I don't really see it. Um, but again, I don't, I don't have any desire to drink. Oh, you're quite welcome there, Soggy Toast. You know, when I started drinking again after I'd stopped the first time, cause I almost died twice. I went into the hospital for drinking once. Um, and that's when I quit cold Turkey. Uh, I didn't have insurance. So the hospital didn't let me stay there. Uh, and so I just, they sent me home and I just went home and laid on the couch and had shakes and sweats and nightmares and fucking night terrors. And it was bad. Um, but after about three years, I started drinking again. And the way it happened is so stupid. I, to this day, I really don't know how to describe it. Um, I was in my kitchen. I hadn't thought about drinking. It's not like this is something that had been on my mind. I hadn't been having cravings. You know, life was going along smooth, not giving anything a thought. And I opened up the cabinet and I was reaching for something. And there was a bottle of vanilla extract right there. And in my alcoholic days, I, you know, vanilla extract was sometimes a luxury. There's many a times I've got drunk off scope you know, mouthwash. Um, so vanilla extract was no problem for me to drink that. And without giving it a thought, I, I 
swear I don't remember the thought crossing my mind before I was doing it. I just pulled the bottle down, unscrewed the lid, and just drank it. And like as it was going down my throat, and I could feel that burning sensation starting to happen, I was just like, "What am I doing?" And like, it, and like, what am I doing? And like, that was it. It was you know, once I got that alcohol in my system, it was I was off to the races, and within less than two years, I was back in the hospital again. And then the second time back in the hospital was the bad, like really, really, really bad time. Um, and that was it. That was the final time. And so hopefully again, hopefully I'm just done, done with it. Um, but again, I don't take anything for granted. I really don't. I feel like I'm living on borrowed time as it is. I should have been dead many times over. I really should have. And I certainly don't talk about this to glorify it or make it sound fucking dramatic or anything. I talk about it because I think it's important to be open about it and honest about it. In case other people have experienced it, are experiencing it, know someone who's experienced it. You know, I, it's just, it's weird. Even living through it, even having been an alcoholic, it's hard to explain uh, the behavior where you just keep doing something that's killing you and you know it's killing you and you just keep doing it and you can't stop yourself from doing it. Um, being outside and seeing someone you love doing that must be baffling and frustrating and angering. Like, I don't know what it must be like to why I have no idea what my wife went through, but I know she probably went through uh, maybe not quite as bad a time as I went, but it's not good for anybody, you know? Um, and, and I don't know how to explain it. I don't know how to explain why, you know, addiction is just, it's a terrible, terrible thing. It really is. Um, I don't know whether you classify it as a disease or an affliction. I tend to think of it as a, like an allergy. Um, I can't have alcohol. Some people can't have shrimp, you know, or they die. I can't have alcohol or I die. I, I don't know why that is. I don't know why I can't drink like a normal person, but I can't. I just can't. You know, I don't need to know why. All I need to know is that I can't. Um, it took a lot of convincing to, for me to finally accept the fact that I can't, but I can't. And so I just don't, and I don't have any desire to anymore. Like alcohol stopped being fun for me so long time ago. Like I don't even kid myself into thinking it would be fun. Um, I wouldn't even get a day of enjoying it before it already sucked again for me. Uh, it would be instant misery if I started drinking again. And I don't ever delude myself into thinking otherwise, even though like my brain can very easily try to do that and tell me it's all going to be fun. You know, it, it's, it's weird. It really is. It's, it's bizarre. I feel like I'm speaking at an AA meeting. Oh, you can definitely still smell it on your breath there, Russell. I got smelled out with vodka plenty of times. Uh, one of the tricks I used to use, though, was I would put a, I don't know why I'm going to tell people this, I would put a Hall's mentholiptus in my mouth. Um, and that menthol flavor would sort of mask the alcohol a little bit, but it's still, you can still smell the alcohol and it's certainly not going to, um, full of breathalyzer. So Um, I'm not sure what you mean. Ultra magnetic. Welcome aboard, by the way. Hey, 310. How are you doing? Another ninja. Don't know if I've, uh, Okay, yeah, you're back. I was going to say, I thought I saw you earlier in there. Um, I feed the high carry algae wafers, and my fish really love them, and I like them, and I like the way they perform in the tank as far as the way they dissolve and all that kind of stuff. Um, I like their ingredient list. As far as the only thing I've ever compared them to algae wafer-wise was some other brand a long time ago that I don't remember, but they turned to mush almost immediately, and I hated them. And I do have the Northfin kelp wafers, and I'm not a huge fan. I don't hate them, but I'm not going to buy them again. And of course, I bought a big ass, you know, favorite size. I bought a big ass bag and now I have a big ass bag of them. But I use the high carry and I, in my opinion, the high carry are just superior uh, to other types of algae wafers. As far as their other types of fish food, I've never really used any of the other uh, high carry stuff. But I assume based on the brand name that they're probably good. I would, I would feel comfortable recommending the high carry brand. Cause I know the algae wafers are the bomb. I love the, the high carry algae wafers. 
Oh, you're saying have a good night there at 310. You're leaving. I thought you were joining. So, all right. Well, you say good night then. I'll say good night. Um, let's see. It's almost 11. We'll go for a little while longer. My mic pack's still green. Yeah, that is 100% accurate there, Russell. There's no, uh, no arguing with that. Um, I don't care whether you do it for your job or the courts or your wife or your children until you're doing it for yourself. Yeah, I swear, I feel like I'm just at a meeting. <laughs> um, but yeah, if, you, if you're not doing it for yourself, it won't last. Sweet Acres, there you are. Oh, it's definitely hard to get out of the habit. Vodka and the Fisherman's Friends. Takes you five hours to drink it. <laughs> you do that, Nether Ninja. I would be interested in seeing that. That's uh, Again, I thought there was East Coast, West Coast. And we could fight over that if you want. Again, East Coast is always better. All right. I watched most of a movie last night, Shamu, if you're interested in watching it. <laughs> uh, it's a good Canadian movie called Strange Brew, speaking of beer. And it's all about beer and hockey because it's a Canadian movie. What the hell else is it going to be about? Oh, the high carry Viber Bites. I forgot completely about the fact that they were Viber Bites. Good for you, Ultra Magnetic. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me that. Um, now in that case, it's either, or I like them both for, yeah, I was watching strange brew, eh? <laughs> um, I'm old. I remember when that came out. Um, I was just going to say, when you think of, um, Rick Moranis, you probably think of, and then I couldn't even think of who the younger generation, like Rick, Rick Moranis, like the last thing he did that would have made him relevant would have been like Ghostbusters or something. Um, but when I think of Rick Moranis, I think of Bob and Doug McKenzie. If you don't know who Bob and Doug McKenzie are, don't worry about it. It's from uh, Second City Television. Second City Television, if you don't know what that is, it's like the Canadian version of Saturday Night Live. It was SCTV and they, they had John Candy and Eugene Levy. Um, uh, fucking uh, the, the dude with the white hair, can't even think of his name now, plays the banjo. <laughs> uh, Steve Martin. Uh, a ton uh, of guys came out of Second City Television and graduated to Saturday Night Live. And uh, Bob and Doug McKenzie were played by Rick Moranis and Dave Thomas, they played a couple of Canadian brothers and they actually did a gig that, or, or did a skit that was very, very similar to Wayne's world uh, where they did like a public broadcasting where they like did their own TV show uh, and out of their basement uh, was usually their, their stick on SCTV. And so they got their own movie and, and they got to do the, the Bob and Doug McKenzie movie again, the same way Wayne's world got to do a movie out of it. But this was like, what, 15 years before Wayne's world, uh, or whatever. So if you're into some really, if you really want to see some, uh, Oh, thank you. Soggy toast. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, so if you really want to see a really, really, really fucking Canadian movie <laughs> and watch Strange Brew, uh, it's, well, I think it came out in the 80s, like 1980 or 81 or something like that. Alexa, when did Strange Brew uh, release? The movie Strange Brew was released on August 26th, 1983. 83, okay, wow. Um, it, it, it feels more late 70s to me than it does 80s, though. Um, it's dumb. It's just a dumb, funny movie. If you're looking for something to fall asleep in front of is kind of what I was thinking of. Cause I, I can pop that one in anytime. So I like the, um, sorry, I got distracted there. Um, I like the crisps because of the way they float and spread out and I can crumble them into very small, you know, almost like a powder to larger flakes if I crumble and kind of let it fall from my fingers at the same time. And so I get everything from very fine fish food to full crisps. 
and it sinks, it sinks slowly, it swirls in the, um, excuse me, it swirls in the water column, and, excuse me, that gives all my water column fish plenty of feeding. With the Viber Bites, I like them because I can break them up somewhat. I can't really crush them. Into, I guess I could grind them into fine powder, but I don't really. Um, the smaller pieces will float on the surface a little bit, but it does sink. Um, but it sinks reasonably slowly, and that gives the fish some time uh, in the water column, but it also makes sure plenty of it gets to the bottom. And a lot of times when I feed with the Viber Bites, I don't go back and put algae wafers in because I know so much of that food's going to be on the bottom that I don't feel it necessary to make sure food gets to the bottom like I do with the algae wafers. So that's kind of the difference between the two. I don't necessarily have a preference. It just depends on what I'm attempting to achieve that will de determine which food I want to use. Uh, you might there, Art Knight. You'd be surprised how little uh, alcohol you have to drink on a regular basis before you'll feel some effects. Um, now, it's not necessarily saying it would be bad, um, but you might you might feel some cravings. You might be a little in a bad mood, might have some trouble sleeping, might have little aches and pains or something like that. Just subtle stuff. You might not really even notice it. You might just think you're having a bad day. You just can't put your finger on why you're in such a cranky mood and whatnot. It might be as simple as that. Um, I drank amounts of alcohol that would fucking kill a normal person. I mean that literally. If you just sat down and tried to keep up with me on a, on a you'd, you'd die by the end of the day if you drank as much alcohol as I did. And again, I'm not bragging. It took me years of drinking that to get to those kinds of levels. Um, but I I was drinking huge amounts of alcohol by the time I was dying of it. <clears throat> Oh, Shamu, that's not good. King of the monsters. I'm glad you're enjoying yourself, Harley, and I'm glad Beth is back home. So yay for that, too, if I didn't say so already. <laughs> Strange, bro. Yeah, it's, it's funny. I don't know. Again, it's just it's funny for me because it's nostalgic funny. You know, again, that's why I'm saying don't bother. If you haven't seen it and you're a... You know, you're 20 years old or something. Don't don't bother. You're not going to think it's funny. Second City was a Chicago stage show. Okay. I was never a big Cheech and Chong fan. I, I could never do it. Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. That's the other Rick Moranis one. It's baseballs, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, space pause is always a good one. It's all right. It's after 11 o'clock. Let me get into my final position here. And uh, I did say this Friday night. I didn't know if you were going to come back, Russell, after our conversation went awry on uh, Wednesday night a couple of weeks ago. But I had said this the other day, and I wanted to make clear to you the hair out of my mouth first um i guess we'll just stick with my bowl because that's nice and easy uh what i should have led that whole conversation with was that Tolkien hated direct allegory i think i talked about this on friday night so i'll be brief about it again but Tolkien hated direct allegory he never wanted to put anything in his books that would force the reader to interpret it a certain way. He always felt that above and beyond all it's art and the reader is going to interpret it through their own lens and the way they want to and so on and so forth. So choking wanted people to see it through different lenses, but that doesn't mean he wanted you to see it any differently than you've always seen it. And you, you know, it's still your story that you interpret your way. Um, and that's how Tolkien would have wanted it. It's, it's everybody, it gets to be your own story. You interpret it however you want to interpret it. And that's for you. And just the idea that other people interpret it different ways uh, was the only thing I was pointing out. And so I wasn't trying to ruin the story for you. And I probably should have led with the Tolkien, you know, wanted people to interpret it through different lenses. And that might have made the whole conversation make more sense. But anyway, I'm not going down that road again. 
High Anxiety was another good one. Um, what's the Mel Brooks one that I like? That uh, Oh, God, is it High Anxiety? I think it is High Anxiety. High Anxiety, Spaceballs. There's one other one. Oh, well, I don't know, Ross. You said that, again, I, it's hard to tell when someone's joking when it's just words and text. I don't get any facial expressions. I don't, you know, so I thought I'd ruin the story for you because I know plenty of people that that would have ruined the story for them. Um, Rod Stewart is still performing. Good God. Is it like Weekend at Bernie's? Like, are there ropes holding him? Like, <laughs> I don't know. I'm just so tired of there's, you know, somebody like Neil Young who their whole shtick was, you know, their whole shtick was sitting on stage strumming a guitar or whatever. Those kind of people. All right. Play until you can't hit the notes anymore. I did hear recently that uh, uh, I watched a video about like people that should like definitely stop touring. And Roger Waters was on that. Apparently he can't hit the notes. He's starting to have a lot of pre-recorded tracks played where he's just lip syncing to it. You know, like, all right, dude, it's, it's time to retire. Um, but for people like Rod Stewart, if you're not familiar with Rod Stewart, back in the day, like he was one of those people that was an absolute sex symbol, like like Mick Jagger or Steven Tyler. You know, those guys are the ones that like, dude, you're like, stop trying to put your foot over your head. You're not a sexy man anymore. You're like 80. Stop it. Like those guys are the ones that drive me crazy when they just keep touring and touring. And like, so Rod Stewart still touring. I, I didn't even know Rod Stewart was still alive and he's still touring. That just blows me away. <clears throat> yeah, I would have passed up on that chance too. I remember my aunt loved Rod Stewart when I was a kid. She had posters of him on the wall. I was <laughs> just kissing. <laughs> but see, that's the other thing. I didn't want to get into a bunch of detail about it. But like I, when I think of a love story, I don't think of a sex story. I don't think of a porno. You know, I, I can watch a love story where I just see a couple fall in love and holding hands and they care about each other and all that stuff. Like my mind doesn't go to the sex. And so whether it's, you know, whoever is involved in the love story, I just see it as a love story. Like it doesn't go to the sex part of it for me. And that's where I think it can get weird for other people too. But in my opinion, that's because they're weird. Like if that's where your brain goes. If you're watching like one of them Hallmark love movies, you know, where the, the couple's falling in love over the fucking Christmas tree and all that shit. And you're imagining him fucking railing her over the kitchen table or something. That's on you. That's not, that's got nothing to do with that movie. That's on you. If that's what's going through your mind when you're watching that kind of stuff, you know, <clears throat> Car, beep, beep, what's going on? I'm Zip. how are you? Torn with Billy Joe. See, Billy Joe, I could see Billy Joe being an old dude sitting up there with his gray hair playing his piano. That's all right. Billy Joe was never a sex symbol. Billy Joe's like a dude from New Jersey that plays the piano. <laughs> and her, and her, uh, had her matter where you could see her, Russell. That's where it's important. How <clears throat> ballet would be interesting. I actually did see the Nutcracker on ice with my wrong wife. I like to think of uh, my right wife, and then there was the wrong one. Um, and I, we got tickets. I don't know how she got tickets to her work or something like that. And I was thinking, yeah, whatever, something to do, you know, go out. Uh, for the evening, dress up and go see this ballet on ice or whatever. It was really good. And I was really surprised. I thought it was going to be some dumb bullshit kids kind of thing because it's on ice or like that was somehow going to take away from it. It actually made it more impressive because it was still ballet. I mean, they were still putting their feet up over their head, but they were doing fucking ice skates on. You know, you know how heavy those things are. Uh, it was incredible what they were doing. And, you know, I was saying the other night how, you know, it's holding somebody over your head when you're running across the stage. Now do hold somebody over your head that's wearing ice skates while you're skating across. You know, it was it blew me away. I was really impressed with seeing the, the Nutcracker on ice. So if you ever get a chance to see it, 
do it. It's really good. I was really surprised, but that was so long ago. Like I said, that was with my wrong wife. So that's been 25 years now. Thank you, Carr. I was just hopefully motivating other people. But a Hobbit ballet would be awesome. Or at least a Hobbit musical. I am not a musical person, but a buddy of mine is. And I was actually thinking tonight of one that's kind of confusing. It's Phantom of the Opera. I've read Phantom of the Opera. I didn't like it. I'm not going to critique it necessarily, but I didn't enjoy it. Um... But when you watch the production of Phantom of the Opera, it started out as a book, but it's a book about something that happens in an opera house. It's not an opera in and of itself. It's, a, it's just a story about something happening in an opera house. And so Andrew Lloyd Webber came along and he made it into a musical production. And so when you listen to it and watch it, it's a story about an opera, but it's actually a musical, but it's a musical about an opera. And at points, you don't know whether you're watching a musical or you're watching opera. It's just weird. Um, and so that one's kind of a toss up for me. Like it feels like opera, but it's a musical sort of thing. Um, but I'm not a big musical fan. I really, I just, I, I really, really don't like musicals as much as you think, of, you know, well, like it's just, it's art and it's performance and all that kind of stuff. Just, I, I can never get the idea like the jets and the sharks, like in their knives out dance fighting. And just, get the fuck away from me. Just the, the dance fighting shit. It's just like so, so dumb to me. I just, I can't get over stuff like that in musicals. I do not like them uh, except for musical Scrooge. That's my one exception. And some people call the Blues Brothers a musical. And if you consider that a musical, then all right, I'll give the Blues Brothers a pass, too, because Blues Brothers is fantastic. Um, but Musical Scrooge with Albert Finney is a straight up musical production. And it's really, really good. And I will give it that. And that's the only musical I'll ever say I like. All right. On that note, I think we're going to probably wind up and get out of here. I think I just threw one of my chunks of butt on the floor somewhere. I was flailing my hands around. Is that it? Uh, nope, that's not it. I felt something fly out of my bowl as I was flailing my hands around. <clears throat> oh, opera's fantastic, Russell. And that's a funny point you say about not being able to understand... Um, all right, Joseph, I will see you on Wednesday. Musopper, <laughs> something like that. But it's funny you say something about not being able to understand opera. There are a few operas out there that are sung in English. Uh, Peter Grimes is one that comes to mind, and I've heard it many times. Um, my radio station I used to listen to, um, I don't anymore just because I have the YouTubes and the headphones and whatnot, but they do a full opera every Saturday afternoon. And I used to make that my day to come down here and I would work in the basement and I'd listen to the opera and I'd learn about it and everything. And so I've heard this Peter Grimes opera several times and I've heard of one or two other. Uh, there's actually an opera about Oppenheimer that I heard years ago before the, you know, long before the movie ever came out. Um, don't listen to an opera in your own language. It's, it's, it's not good. When I listen to The Barber of Seville, for example, that's my favorite opera. They're singing in Italian. I have no fucking idea what they're singing. I kind of know the story and I know enough about, you know, what some of the words mean and stuff like that. I can kind of follow along enough because I'm familiar with it. But it sounds like they're just singing these musical words to me. You know, when you listen to something like Peter Grimes, they're literally singing about how I'm going to go down the street and do this thing. And I forgot to lock the door. So don't wait up for me, but they're singing it in their opera voice. And it's not too far off from fucking Adam Sandler doing his opera guy bullshit on Saturday night live, which was not funny. And so when it's, it's just weird, it's just weird listening to somebody sing 
words that should otherwise be spoken. But when you're listening to Italian or, or, or you know, German, well, you know, Mozart loved his German operas, it just sounds like music. I don't know what they're singing, but they're singing the same kind of stuff. You know, when you listen to Barbara Seville, he's singing about how great it is to be the barber. And I'm the barber. I get to do different barber stuff. It doesn't sound as good when you sing it in English. It really doesn't. So if you ever are going to listen to opera and you're not familiar with opera, listen to one that's not in your own language. Trust me on that. Don't 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 pick one in English because oh, I want to listen to one I understand. No, you don't. You don't want to listen to one you understand. You want to listen to one where you have to read the fucking program to find out what's happening. That's the kind of opera you want to listen to. Roar. All right, everybody. Operas in English are super disappointing, surely. Uh, no, no doubt about it. All right. On that note, I hope you all feel educated tonight. Uh, remember, any more comments, any thoughts about the whole nitrate thing? If you missed that earlier and you joined us late, uh, around five after nine or so, uh, a little over an hour in, we started talking about nitrate. And we went maybe half an hour or so where we went into like a lot of in-depth talking about nitrate and so on and so forth. So if you missed that, go watch the rewatch. If you got any questions or whatever, you can hit me up. I'll be back next Friday for public viewing, uh, 8 p.m. Eastern time. Of course, we're on daylight savings time now. Don't forget. Uh, and then my members will be, uh, of course, back here 8 o'clock on Wednesday for members only. So check that out. $2.99 a month if you're interested. Uh, otherwise, I will see you all on friday thank you as always i had a good time i hope you did too good night everybody